Hadiths. He has also authored many books on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir Naik is the ideologue and driving force behind Peace TV Network. He launched Peace TV in English in January 2006, it being the largest watch Islamic as well as any religious satellite TV channel presently in the world with over 100 million viewership of which 25% are non-Muslims. In its footstep, he launched Peace TV Urdu in 2009, Peace TV Bangla in 2011, and Peace TV Chinese in 2015. Inshallah, he plans to expand the Peace TV network to cover the 10 major languages of the world. Very, very impressive, isn't it? Therefore, uh, without further ado, uh, brothers and sisters, now it's the time. Are you ready, sisters? Yeah. Are you ready, brothers? Yeah. How about our brothers and sisters out there? And maybe outside as well? Are you all ready? Yeah. Now, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, UUM, we proudly present you Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Nai to the stage. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Al Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma bad. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Kuntum khaira ummatin akhrijat lin nas. Ta'muruna bil ma'roofi wa tanahuna in munkar wa tu'minuna billah. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa yasilli amri. Wa halul ugdata min lisani yafkaw kawli. My respected professors, my respected teachers, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to be, in, for me to be invited in the University of Tara, Malaysia. I have been to most of the states of Malaysia, I think nine or more than that, but it's my first speech in Kedah, in the UUM. And inshallah, as the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dr. Hendrick said, first, but not the last. The topic of this evening's talk of mine is duty of a Muslim as a professional or duty of a Muslim professional. Before we dwell into the topic, let us understand what is the meaning of the word professional. According to the Oxford Dictionary, the word professional means a person who is skilled in a particular subject or a particular activity, or the word professional means, according to the Oxford Dictionary, engaged 
in a specific activity which is his main paid occupation. So profession means a person who is skilled or competent in a particular activity. For a person to be a professional, he should be trained in that activity. For example, if a person wants to be a medical doctor, he should be trained and he should pass his graduation in the field of medicine. If a person wants to be an engineer, he has to pass his graduation in the subject of engineering. If he has to be a professional lawyer, he should be trained and a graduate in the field of law. If he has to be an architect, he should be trained and should pass the graduation in the field of architecture. In short, if you have to be a professional, you have to be trained in that subject of professionalism. And for a person to be a successful profession, he should follow the rules and regulation of that profession. For a person to be a successful medical doctor, he should follow the rules and regulation of medicine. For a person to be a professional engineer, he should follow the rules and regulation of engineering. For a person to be a professional lawyer, he should follow the rules and regulation of law. In short, the more you follow the rules and regulation of that professional, the more you will be a professional in that field. The more experience you are in that field, the more will you be a professional, more successful profession in that field. This was, in brief, in a nutshell, the meaning of the word professional. But today's topic is not duty of a professional, but today's topic is duty of a Muslim as a professional. What is the meaning of the Arabic word Muslim? Muslim means a person who submits his will to his creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, almighty God. In short, a Muslim is a person who follows all the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim is a person who follows the teachings of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What is the definition of a Muslim professional? A Muslim professional is a person who submits his will to his creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follows all the teachings of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of the last and final messenger and follows the rules and regulations of his profession. Please let me remind you that just because the name of that individual is Muhammad, Zakir, Sultan, Abdullah, and he's a professional, that doesn't make him a Muslim professional. That doesn't make him a Muslim professional. For a person to be a Muslim professional, he has to follow the rules of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and follow the rules of his profession. If he has a Muslim name, Muhammad Zakir Abdullah Sultan, and doesn't follow the rules and regulation of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is not a Muslim professional. Rather, he is a namesake Muslim professional or a pseudo Muslim professional. So please keep in mind in this complete talk of mine. Whenever I use the word Muslim professional, it means a person who submits the will to Allah, follow the, follows the rules and regulation of the glorious Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and follows the rules of his profession. There is a golden rule for a Muslim professional. That what if the teachings of Islam the teachings of glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, contradicts with the teachings of your profession. In such case, the golden rule is that you have to follow the teachings of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith 
and not the teachings of that profession. Whenever the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the teachings of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, if it contradicts with the teachings of your profession, the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, the last and final messenger, overrules the teachings of that profession. This is the general ruling that if the head overrules the assistant head, if your CEO overrules your assistant CEO, the word of the CEO has to be followed. So here, our ultimate boss is our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me give you a few examples for a better understanding. For a professional salesman, a salesman is taught that a good salesman is a person who is able to easily sell his goods to his customer. And there is a very famous saying, a good salesman is a person who sells a refrigerator to an Eskimo. How many people have heard this idiom before that a good salesman is a person who sells a refrigerator to an Eskimo? Please raise your hand. How many, how many have heard this before? How many? Very few. I think this was a university of management. It's a very famous idiom. Who has heard it before? Please raise your hand. Hardly anyone. Yes, there are a few people, but compared to, I'm told there are about six, 7,000 people in the auto area, many people sitting on the floor, and a few thousand outside. Anyway, this is a very famous idiom, a saying that a good salesman is a person who sells a refrigerator to an Eskimo. I would like to ask you a simple question. Can a Muslim professional sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo? Can a Muslim be so competent enough to sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo? Yes or no? Yes, who says yes, raise your hand. Can a Muslim be competent enough to sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo? Who says yes, raise your hand. Who says no, raise your hand. Both the times, I think, there's a language barrier. <laughs> yes, people are laughing. It means they're understanding me. But when I'm saying yes, no one is raising the hand. When I'm saying no, no one is raising the hand. <laughs> Again, let me ask that question. Who says that a Muslim professional can sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo? Raise your hand. MashaAllah, now, more than... Who says a Muslim professional cannot sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo? Raise the hand. Okay, everyone hasn't participated, but more people agree that a Muslim can sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo. According to me, a Muslim professional cannot sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo. Why is the question, why? Because selling a refrigerator to an Eskimo means you're selling a good to a customer who does not require it. So in the field of salesmanship, he's a professional salesman. He's selling a refrigerator to an Eskimo. Where does Eskimo require a refrigerator? But it shows his skill, professional person. But according to the teachings of Quran and Hadith, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Hadith of Sunnan Abu Dawud, volume number four, Hadith number 3452. The beloved Prophet said, anyone who cheats is not one of us. If you're selling a refrigerator or Eskimo, you're selling a good which is not required by the customer, that means you are misguiding him, you are cheating him. So this is not permitted according to the teachings of Quran and Sunnah. 
So now the teachings of Quran and Sunnah contradict with the teachings of professionalism. So what do you do? You follow the teachings of Quran and Sunnah, it overrules the teachings of salesmanship. Irrespective how much bonus you get, that is besides the point. Irrespective you may get a raise in the salary, they may raise your position, okay, now you have become head of sales. But if it contradicts with the teachings of Quran and Sunnah, you do not have to follow the teachings of salesmanship. Is it clear? Let me give you a few more examples. <clears throat> in the subject of hotel management, normally when you do your bachelor's in hotel management, they teach you that when you're serving your customer beer, you don't just pour it into the glass. That's not the style. The professionalism says that when you're serving beer to your customer, you tilt the glass at an angle of 45 degrees. And you pour the beer on the sides of the glass, so it slowly goes into it. Once the glass becomes about 50% full, half full, you make the glass straight and pour it in the center. I won't describe the logic of it, because you know there's more froth and better, all that, leave it aside. But can a professional, Muslim professional hotel manager, serve beer in this fashion? Yes or no? No. Why? It contradicts the teachings of Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O oh you believe, innam al khamru al maifuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wa anzaab al aslamu, dedication of stone, dedication of arrows, rich suminam and shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork, first and imul alukum tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Allah says that drinking alcohol, intoxicants, gambling, dedication of stone, idol worship, divination of arrows, these are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in a Sahih Hadith of Sunan Ibn Majah, volume number four, Hadith number 3381, our beloved Prophet said that Allah has cursed 10 categories of people who deal with alcohol. The person who distills it, the person for whom it is distilled, the person who drinks it, the person who transports it, the person for whom it is transported, the person who serves it, the person who makes a profit from the sale, the person who buys it, the person for whom it is bought. All these 10 categories of people Allah has cursed. So if you are a professional hotel manager, if you serve alcohol, Allah will curse you. So, irrespective whether you serve direct or tilting the glass at a 45 degree angle, irrespective whatever it is, you cannot serve alcohol. Let me give you one more example. We're into business management and I'm told that this is the maximum students that are here, according to the deputy vice chancellor, is in management and social studies. When you're doing your bachelor's in business management, BBM, or MBA, if you are a professional entrepreneur or a businessman, and when you want to start a new business, and if you don't have a capital, the best way to obtain a capital which you don't have is to take a loan from a conventional bank on interest. It is the cheapest and the easiest way. In other ways, you have to maybe share a lot of profit. Bank, only the interest rate. Depending upon the country, maybe 2-3%, maybe 4%. If it's a country where inflation is high, maybe 8%, 10%. As a Muslim, you cannot take loan from a conventional bank on interest. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Bakhra, chapter number 2, verse number 278 and 279, Oh, you believe, give up your demands on riba, on usury, on interest. And if you give up not your demands on interest, take a notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. That means if you do not, if you indulge in riba, in interest, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. According to Imam al Dhabi, it is the twelfth major sin in Islam.
and a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that anyone who takes riba or gives riba or is a witness during the riba transaction, all three, they will not go to Jannah. We will not wage a war against you. If you take interest, Allah says in the Quran, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. And unfortunately, majority of the businessmen in the world, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unfortunately, they take interest from a conventional bank. It is haram. As far as Islamic banking is concerned, there are some reservations, but if you have option to take from a conventional bank or Islamic bank, take from Islamic bank. I would prefer not taking from any bank. It is the best to be safe. But if you have to take, take from an Islamic bank. It may not be 100% Sharia compliant, you cannot be, but to a great extent, yes. And Malaysia, the country that we are living in, it is the second largest in the world after Saudi Arabia as far as Islamic banking is concerned. Even the conventional bank have an Islamic window. Let's not go into the interest-free banking, that's another lecture of mine. But I hope you got the message. If it contradicts with the teachings of Quran and Sunnah, follow the teachings of Quran and Sunnah. Let me give you another example. In professionalism, we are taught that when you meet a customer or your colleague, especially the first time, normally you shake hands to break the ice. When you shake hands, it's an informal way of greeting. There is closeness developed. There is a rapport between the two people. That is professionalism. As far as Islam is concerned, if a Muslim professional shakes hand with any other Muslim, with any other professional or any other man, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, no problem. If a female Muslim professional shakes hand with any other female, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, no problem. But in Islam, a Muslim professional man cannot shake hand with a female irrespective whether she is a Muslim or non-Muslim if she is a Nahmera. And a female Muslim professional cannot shake hand with a male whether Muslim or non-Muslim if he is not a Mehra. The close relatives who you can marry, husband, brother, sister, mother, and son, all these are permitted. But if it's a foreign, means a Nahmeram, it is not permitted. But normally when we move around in the world, especially in the Western world, and now it has percolated to most of the countries in the world, it's common that when professionals of opposite sex meet, they usually shake hands. And normally, if an opposite sex extends the hand, especially if a lady extends the hand to a Muslim professional, invariably, by reaction, your hand will go and you'll shake it. Unless you're mentally prepared, mentally you're trained that I do not have to shake hands with the opposite sex. Unless you're mentally trained, it's an invariable reaction that your hand goes off forward. I remember when I was invited by the president of Gambia in the 2014 as the main guest of honor, chief guest, during the national day. And I happened to be on the stage. He was in the center, his wife on the left, I was on the right. And the function was going on suddenly, you know, most of the dignitaries, they were ambassadors. Then suddenly I find that people coming onto the stage and shaking. And then since I was on the right of the president, the first person that shook hands was with me. And I had no problem shaking hands. Suddenly I see the ambassador of USA coming. She happened to be a lady. And I see her walking up the stage, and now I'm in a dilemma. <laughs> I'm the guest of the president of the country. 
you know, I don't want to offend him. So now, should I, should I take care of my host, the president of the country, or should I follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The answer is very clear cut. Let him be the president of any country, or prime minister, or the king. If it contradicts with your creator, you overrule. And when the ambassador of USA, lady, when she extended the arm, I said, may peace be on you. And I said, my religion does not permit me to shake hands with a lady. I was prepared for the consequences. But alhamdulillah, the president of Gambia, when he noticed me, immediately signaled the foreign minister to come on the stage. And he whispered something, and the foreign minister was next to me. The moment the next lady came, he told, please don't shake hands with Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. I was impressed with the president of Gambia. I thought that, you know, maybe he'd get angry, but no one can overrule my Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he was, mashallah, he protected my, my status, awkward position, and the foreign minister did the job for me, and the function continued. You are sometimes in many awkward positions, that though you know it is wrong, but you give in to it because, ah, the prime minister is there, oh, the king is there, oh, the president is there. How can I, how can I go against the prime minister or the, and by Allah's grace, I had many occasions. I'll just give you one sample. So when shaking hands is there with the same sex, no problem, it's correct, it gets closeness to you. It creates a rapport, I agree with it. But you can't create a rapport with opposite sex na mehram. It's not permitted. For more details, you can refer to my lecture on women's rights. I'll not go into the details. Let me give you one last example. You know, there is, there is a profession called as personal secretary. It's a profession. And you have got courses on being a personal secretary. And very often, in most parts of the world, not always, but mostly, for a gent boss, you have a lady personal secretary. As far as the teachings of Islam is concerned, A lady being a personal secretary to a gent boss, or a gent being a personal secretary to a lady boss, it is prohibited. If you take utmost care, it can reach makroor in few cases. And there are various reasons for this. You know, personal secretary is taking care of the boss's need. And especially in the Western countries, the personal needs of the boss extends. I don't want to go into the detail. Very often, the lady personal secretary takes care of all personal needs of the boss, including haram needs. It's very common. It is not permitted because the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Hadith of at tirim Sunnan at tirmidhi Hadith number 1171, that if two Nahmeram are secluded in a room, the third person is the Satan. If two Nahmeram are, sec are secluded in a room, the third person is the Satan. If you are a personal secretary, there will be many occasions where your gent boss would be giving you instruction in his cabin when the door is closed. It is not permitted. The third person is the Satan. It is haram. Whether they do any act or not, the act of being alone with a naham haram in a closed room itself is prohibited. As for shaking hand, the hadith is of Jame al Kabir, Jame al Mutam al Kabir. Hadith number 486, that it is preferable to stab in the head an eye and needle than to touch the part of an unlawful woman, therefore touching is haram. 
Other hadith of Tirmidhi says that if you touch, a man touches a part of a non-mehram woman, that part will burn in hell. So based on the teachings of Quran and Sunnah, touching a non-mehram opposite sex is prohibited, and being a personal secretary. Other post, maybe it can be accepted as long as you follow the rules of Quran and Sunnah, but being a personal secretary of a nahmeram, female secretary of a man or a man secretary of a female boss, in most of the cases, haram may go to makro. So I hope by these examples, it is clear what is the basic golden rule of the duty of a Muslim professional. Now we go ahead with the topic in detail. In professionalism, we are taught that when we do a job or when we sign a contract, when we get employed, we have to follow all the rules and regulations of the contract. It's taught in professionalism. But if you're a Muslim professional, there is a double duty that you have to follow what you have signed in the contract. Because besides the rules of professionalism saying that you have to follow your contract, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 177, that fulfill the contracts that you have made. Allah says in Surah Marriage, chapter number 70, verse number 32 and 35, that those people who fulfill their covenants and they trust, they will enter Jannah, a garden of bliss. Allah says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 8 and 11, that those who fulfill the covenant and the contracts, they will enter Jannah and they will dwell therein forever. That means if you are a Muslim professional, you have to follow all the rules and regulation of what you have signed in the contract. But you have to be careful. Any rule and regulation should not go against Quran and Sunnah. But if it doesn't go, it becomes your double duty to follow it. Let me give you an example. If the contract of your job says that you have to be in the office from 9 to 6, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., that means you have to see to it that you have to come to the office before 9 a.m. and leave the office after 6 p.m. It's very common that many a times you receive a phone call from your family member, maybe your wife, your husband. You know, you may receive a call from your friends and you speak for maybe 10 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes, sometimes for an hour. When you're speaking during office hours with your family member or friends, what are you doing? For that 10 minutes, 20 minutes, one hour, you are not doing the duty of the office that has been entrusted on you, point number one. Point number two, besides not doing the duty, you are being paid for the time you are speaking with your family member or your friends. This is not permitted in Islam. There are many times, and it's very common nowadays that during office hours, the employee goes to social media, WhatsApp, maybe YouTube, Maybe Facebook, it may be Tumblr, it may be Snapshot, Twitter, maybe Pinterest. You spend every day half an hour, one hour, two hours, come in, chatting. And many a times when you go to offices, you find the receptionist or the manager is busy chatting. Spending time on your personal fun, frolic, or personal work during office hours is prohibited. If there is an emergency where you have to speak to your family because there's an emergency, you see to it that you compensate those minutes, that hours, after office hours. As a Muslim professional, you cannot utilize the office time for which you are being paid salary to do your personal work. It's prohibited. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 56, We have created the jinn and the men not but to worship me. 
Allah says in the Quran that I have created the jinn and the men not but only to worship me. So one of our main duties, one of the purpose of our creation in this world is to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Arabic word ibadah used here comes from the root word abd which means slave, which means worship. Most of the Muslims think that worship only means, you know, salah, zakat, psalm, fasting, going for hajj. Yes, these are one of the highest forms of worship. But ibadah means following any commandment of Allah you're following, it's called as ibadah. Anything you abstain from, which Allah has told you not to do, you're doing ibadah. So in the work, if you're following the contract, you're doing ibadah. If you're breaking the contract, you're going against ibadah. There's a very famous hadith called as Hadith Jibreel. It's in Sahih Bukhari, worm number one, hadith number 50. Once the Prophet was sitting with the Sahaba, then a man, an angel, Jibreel Islam, comes and asks the Prophet three questions. What is Iman? What is faith? What is Islam? Submission to Allah. And what is Ahsan? The hadith is big, I'll jump, jump to the main part that relates to the topic. The third question, what is Ahsan? And the Prophet replies, Ahsan means proficiency. The Arabic word Ahsan means excellence. The Prophet says, Ahsan, proficiency, excellence mean you worship Allah as though you see him. And if you cannot see him, worship Allah as though he is watching you. So according to a Prophet, excellence, proficiency, Ahsan means at least worship Allah as though he's watching you. Now for an employee, it is common that when the boss is present, you work better. Because you want to show to the boss or your superior, oh, you're very, you know, you're proficient. You're a good employee. So when the boss is there, close to you, watching you, you work a bit extra, you work with proficiency, you do hard work. For a Muslim professional, our ultimate boss is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Irrespective whether your worldly boss, your manager, is watching you or not, your ultimate boss is always watching you. So always at work, you will be at your best. If you are a Muslim professional, you have to follow Ahsan. You work as though your ultimate boss Allah is watching you, so you will do your best activity, you will not speak with a family member at office time, you will not go to social media, you will see to your productive, to your company, as a Muslim professional. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ismail Sunan Sunnah Ibn Maja, volume number four, hadith number 3170, that Allah has prescribed Ahsan, proficiency, excellence for all his creations. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed that all his creations, all the human beings, including the Muslims, he has prescribed for them Ahsan, proficiency, excellence. That means you have to do things which are excellent. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, It's mentioned in the hadith of Jame Matridi, Al Autas, volume number one, hadith number 897. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that Allah loves those people who strive for Hassan, for excellence, for perfectness. Allah loves those people who are perfect, who are excellent. That means, if you are a Muslim doctor, you have to be an excellent doctor. 
if you are a Muslim engineer, you have to be an excellent engineer. If you are a Muslim architect, you have to be an excellent architect. If you are a Muslim CEO, you have to be an excellent CEO. If you are a Muslim manager, you have to be an excellent manager. We have signed a contract that you have to be in office from 9 to 6, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. But you know that if you spend a few hours more, maybe one or two hours a day, or maybe work during holiday, your level in excellence will improve. So what do you do? As a professional Muslim manager, a professional Muslim CEO, you spend a couple of hours more most of the days. You may come to work during holiday so that you achieve the level of excellence in what you have promised. An excellent professional with a lesser position and lesser salary is a better Muslim and more beloved to Allah than an incompetent professional with a better position and better salary. It's difficult to digest everything. Let me give you a simple example. An excellent assistant manager is more beloved to Allah than a, with a lesser position and lesser salary than compared to an incompetent manager with a better position and better salary. Have you understood this golden rule? Yes or no? That means many of us strive, okay, increase my post, increase my position. When your post increases, when your salary increases, if you're incompetent for that post, Allah does not love you. It's better to be on a lesser post and be competent with lesser salary and lesser position than strive for a higher post and be incompetent for that post. Is it clear? These are all golden rules, all gems from the Quran and the authentic sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 60, Hal jaza'ul ahsan illa al ahsan. Is there, is there any reward for good? Is there any reward for good other than good? Is there any ahsan? Is there any reward for ahsan better than ahsan? Is there any reward for excellence better than excellence? Allah is telling you in this verse of the Quran that the best is you have to excel in your profession. A beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it mentions Sayyid Muslim, verse number six, hadith number six, 6637. And Abu Prophet also said in Sahih Muslim, volume number seven, hadith number 6774, that a strong believer is more beloved to Allah than a weak believer. That means a strong professional is more beloved to Allah than a weak professional. It means a competent professional is more beloved to Allah than an incompetent professional. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 76. There is a parable of two people. One of them is dumb. And he cannot do any good. He's a very same burden for his boss. Whatever he instructs him, he cannot do good. On the other hand, is he better than a person who is truthful on just and on the straight path? Here yeah, Allah in the Quran is giving an example of two people. One, some, one person is a dumb person who is a burden for his boss, cannot do any good. 
Is he better than a person who is on justice and on the straight path? And the answer is clear. That means Allah prefers you being an efficient, competent professional than an inefficient person, a professional who is a burden for the boss. Allah says in the Quran, Wallahu, Wallahu ahubbul muhsineen. Allah loves those who do good. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 195. Allah says in Surah, uh, Surah Imran, chapter number three, verse number 134. In Surah Imran, chapter number three, verse number 148. In Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number 13, as well as in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number 93, Wallahu yubbul muhsineen. Allah loves those who do good. Allah loves those who are proficient. Allah loves those who are excellent. So if you want Allah to love you, you have to be efficient and proficient in your profession. And the best example is our beloved Prophet Muhammad A Muslim professional should be trustworthy. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad he was given the title Al-Ameen, the trustworthy. So much so that even his enemies, they trusted him more than the others. They were his enemies, but they said, okay, if we have to leave any of our goods when we are going out of town, the safest person, the most trustworthy person in the whole of Mecca was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even the enemies left their goods with the Prophet. He was given the title Al-Ameen. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ishmael Sunan Abu Daud, oil number four, Hadith number 3534, our beloved Prophet said that entrust your trust on the person who has given you trust. That means someone has entrusted you with something, you fulfill your trust. And do not betray the person who betrays you. Double instruction. Fulfill the trust on the person who has given you the trust. And do not betray even the person who has betrayed you. That means a Muslim professional should be trustworthy. And do not betray even the person who has betrayed you. And we know when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did Hijra, when he did Hijrat, from Makkah to Medina, he told Hazrat Ali Radhiallahuan that these are the goods the people have kept me for safety. When I go away, give it to so-and-so person, all these goods, who it belong to. Imagine these people were the enemies of the Prophet because of whom he leaves Makkah. They are after his life, some of them. They want to kill him. Yet, what the Prophet says, this is an amana. They entrusted that good with me. When I do hijrat, give these goods to so and so people. This is called alabin. And second, do not betray even the person who has betrayed you. So as a Muslim professional, you have to be trustworthy. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, mentioned Sahih Muslim, point number six, hadith number 6637, that truthfulness leads to righteousness, which leads to Jannah. Lies leads to wickedness, and wickedness leads to hellfire. That means a professional Muslim should always be truthful and honest and should not lie. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, hadith number 2079, the beloved Prophet said that a seller and a buyer, they can either keep the goods or return as long as they do not depart. As long as they do not depart, the seller and the buyer, they can either keep the goods or return the goods. And the hadith continues that both of them should speak the truth. They should tell the good things as well as the defects of the goods. Then there will be barqa in the transaction. If any of you lie and even hide the defects, there will be no barqa in the transaction. 
Normally, in professionalism, you are taught that you have to always praise your goods and hide your defects so that you can sell the goods. But our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, when you are a buyer or a seller, speak the truth. Tell the good points, also the defects. If you hide the defects, the transaction will not have barka. So Muslim professional will never lie. He'll always be truthful. He will always be honest. He would even tell the defects of the goods. Now let me tell you one thing, that professionalism actually is of various kinds. Some are short-term professionalism. Short-term means immediate profit. In this short-term professionalism, they teach you no problem as long as you sell your goods, sell the refrigerator to an Eskimo, hide the defects. But a truly long-term professional, they will always teach you that if you hide the defects tomorrow, they will not trust you for a new product. So in the higher level of professionalism, you will find that many teachings of Quran and Sunnah match with it. But today's world is a world of commercialization. Shortcut, fatafat. You want to earn money, fast money, tomorrow who has seen. So when you go to the lower level of professionalism, it contradicts with many rules of Quran and Sunnah. But the higher level of professionalism, not all the rules, but it does match with many rules of the Quran and Sunnah. The Muslim profession should be honest and he should not lie. A Muslim professional, he should be strong. And there are hadith, we speak about this. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, hadith number 265, that anyone who even has an atom of arrogance will not enter Jannah. Arrogance means rejecting the truth and looking down on others. Arrogance in Islam is not only haram, it is the 17th major sin in Islam. Even if you are an atom of arrogance in your heart, you shall not enter Jannah. And normally we see that a person or a professional who has more fame, a better position, more wealth, he tends to be more arrogant. But a Muslim professional, the more power he has, the more fame he gets, the more wealth he gets, he has to become more humble. It is compulsory that a Muslim professional should be humble. He cannot afford to be arrogant. And the more excellent he is in his profession, the humbler he has to be. And the best example was a beloved Prophet Muhammad A beloved Prophet at his time was the main, most famous human being on the earth. The most powerful on the earth. People were willing to give him the wealth of the countries. But our beloved Prophet was one of the, he was the humblest person that has walked on the face of the earth. The glorious Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse 135, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you believe, stand out for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives, whether it be rich or poor. Here Allah is talking about justice. And you should not favor anyone. It's talking about that you have to be on the haq as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if that truthfulness is going against your own self against your parents, against your relatives, against the rich or the poor. We can understand from this verse very well that as far as being honest, truthful, you should not take any sides, even if it's against yourself, 
against your parents, against your relatives. The first time when I read this verse, I could not understand what does the Quran mean by against the rich or against the poor? Against the rich, yes. Maybe he'll benefit you tomorrow, so you can give a verdict in his favor. But why should someone give a verdict in favor of the poor? Later on, I realized what Allah says, that even if it be against the rich or the poor, Allah protects both. That means you cannot say, poor man, if I give a correct justice, he will lose his job. So I give judgment in his favor. That is also not allowed. Poor person, if I punish him for his mistake, how will he sustain? So I give the verdict in his favor. It is not permitted. Allah says, irrespective of whether he's rich or poor, you have to be just, adal. And the Prophet said, if anyone robs, even if it be my daughter Fatima, I will cut her hand. Justice. We find many a times in the profession of lawyer, especially if it's a criminal lawyer, the more famous he is, the higher is his fees. And most of the criminals, they hire the famous criminal lawyer. The lawyer knows very well that my client is a criminal, he has broken his law, but they use their intelligence to protect the client so that they get a fat fees. A Muslim criminal lawyer, if he knows that his client has broken the law of the country or has done a crime, no way can he protect him in the court of law. Muslim lawyer means a lawyer who follows the Quran in Sunnah, not a lawyer whose name is Muhammad Zakir Sultan Abdullah. I know many Muslim criminal lawyers who are top, and most of them, their clients are criminals. You have a Muslim professional has to be just, and there cannot be partialism. There is a hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said that the highest in the scale, it is character. The heaviest in the scale is character. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 21, verily in the messenger of Allah, you will find the most beautiful pattern of conduct. Allah says in Surah Kalam, chapter number 68, verse number 4, Thou art standeth on the exalted platform of character. Allah, our creator, is praising a prophet that he is on the highest level of character. Every Muslim professional should have a very good character. If he doesn't have a good character, he is not a Muslim professional. He can be a pseudo-Muslim professional, he can be a fake Muslim professional, but if his character is bad, he cannot be a good Muslim professional. As far as professionalism is concerned, it is very important that while you're following the rules and regulation of professionalism, you should not neglect any obligatory duties of a Muslim. There are many obligatory duties. Among the important ones are praying five times salah every day, fasting in the month of Ramadan, giving zakat if you have to, going to Hajj if you have to. If you are a Muslim professional, you have to offer five times salah. Especially those salah which are overlapping with, with your office hours, you have to perform. You cannot say during office hours, you know, I will go home and do kaza. Not permitted. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, the hadith of Sahih Muslim, volume number one, hadith number 246. The difference between Iman and Kufr, it is abundance of Salah. If you don't offer Salah, it is Kufr. You're not a Muslim. And many a times, many Muslims, when they work in non-Muslim companies, especially in non-Muslim countries, many of them, they feel shy to offer Salah. You know, maybe they're embarrassed, 
or maybe they feel that their boss, non-Muslim boss, will not allow them to offer salah. As far as my experience goes, I have traveled in several countries of the world. According to me, most of the non-Muslim bosses, even in non-Muslim countries, they will not prevent a Muslim from offering salah during office hours as long as they do not disturb the other employees and as long as they do their work properly. They will not prevent. Almost all will not prevent. Maybe if they have objection, you can say, fine, if I have spent 20 minutes in offering salah, I will work 20 minutes more. Okay, I will work 40 minutes more, no problem. If the salah comes in your lunch time, there's no problem, but if it comes in the office hours, you can work that time extra. Most of the non-Muslim bosses and most of the non-Muslim country will not prevent you. But there are few, very minority, who may object. If you are not able to convince your boss that you have to offer salah, what do you have to do? You have to leave the job. If the non-Muslim boss forces you that you cannot offer salah during office hours, you have to leave the job, as simple as that. We'll come to the second part of the lecture, how it will benefit. You have to. Maybe Allah will give you a better job. There are various other examples. Keeping a beard, according to all the four madahib, all the four imams, according to Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ibn Nambal, all four imams said that keeping a beard is fard. Some scholars may say it's not for sunnah. So, if you want to keep a beard and your boss disagrees, try and convince your boss. How will it cause a harm? You see my performance, if it's slow, you can sack me. But yet if he says, no, you cannot keep a beard, what do you do? You search for a better job. Similarly, for the, for the women, for the Muslima, who are professional, they have to maintain the hijab. If your Muslim or non-Muslim boss, there are some Muslim bosses also don't like women doing hijab or men keeping a beard. If they object and they don't allow you to wear your hijab, you leave the job and search for a better job. Better at least for the akhirah, if not for the dunya. These are golden rules of Muslim professionalism. We'll go to the second part of the lecture. That is tawakkul. Let me ask you a simple question. What is the most common reason that most of the human beings take up a profession, take up a job? What is the most common reason that most of the human beings in the world take up a job? For? For earning money. Your answer is correct. Simple question, simple answer. The most common reason, almost all of the people, not 100%, most of them, for earning money, for sustenance, for risk. All of us think, how much money will we earn for our sustenance? We think about the tomorrow. We have a riskophobia. You won't find this word in the Oxford Dictionary. We have a riskophobia. We have a mania towards risk. We are desperate. We have a despair that what will happen tomorrow? What will we earn? Will we have enough money for tomorrow? When I die, will it be sufficient for my children? All these questions come in our mind. Riskophobia. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number seven, hadith number 6748. Our beloved Prophet said that 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala wrote the risk he wrote the destiny, wrote the qadr, 
including risk of all its creations. That means all the living creatures in the world, including the human being, Allah has written the qadr, the destiny, including the risk. Not 50,000 years before you were born, 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. What is written in the risk, you will get it. No one can add even one penny or one cent or one ringgit to it. No one can take away one penny, one ringgit from it. A beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, it mentioned in Sayyid Muslim, volume number seven, hadith number 6723, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has created the creation in the womb of the mother and get them together in 40 days. Then, that creation is in the form of alaqa for the same period, another 40 days. Then in the form of mudga, a chewed-like lump. Alaqa means a leech-like substance, a congealed clot of blood. Then mudga, a chewed-like lump, for the same period, 40 days. That means 40 plus 40 plus 40, 120 days. Approximately four months. Then Allah sends an angel to write down four things. Number one, it is sustenance, risk. Number two, your lifespan. Number three, the good deeds. Number four, happiness or misery. So all these four things, the angel writes, when you are four months in the womb of your mother, your risk, your sustenance has been written. How long will you, will, will you live has been written. The good deeds you will do has been written. Happiness and misery has been written. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sunan Ibn Majah, volume number three, hadith number 2144, that our beloved Prophet said, O oh my people, fear Allah and seek a moderate living. O oh my people, fear Allah and seek a moderate living. And before any soul dies, he will get all what is written for his sustenance, even if it's delayed. Means no soul shall die until he receives all what is mentioned in the sustenance, even though it is delayed. O oh my people, fear Allah and have a moderate sustenance. Do things which are permitted and abstain from things which are prohibited. Do things which are halal and abstain from things which are haram. This beautiful hadith tells us very clearly that what is mentioned in a qadr, in the sustenance, you will surely get it. If the whole world wants to prevent you from getting that risk, what is mentioned in a qadr, they cannot. If the whole world tries to take away what is mentioned in a qadr, they cannot. So Muslim professional has tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim professional is not dependent upon his profession for the money he earns. A normal professional, yes, he is dependent on his profession for his risk. He thinks that if he excels, he will get better salary, he'll get more income. A Muslim professional who believes in Allah and his Rasul, in the teachings of Quran and Sayyid Hadith, is not dependent on his profession. What is mentioned in his qadr, he will surely get it. And the Prophet said, reduce your sustenance. So good Muslim, he reduces his requirement now, once you have less requirement, you don't have to strive and do wrong things to earn money. Most of us human beings, what they do, they live their lifestyle according to what they earn. If they earn more, then they have a big house, they have a very expensive watch, they have a very good car, Mercedes, Ferrari, Lamborghini. So they lead their life according to what they earn. Our beloved Prophet said, make your sustenance less 
and by Allah's grace, alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me, alhamdulillah, and there was never any problem of finance in my life. If we wanted, in Bombay where I was, the amount of money we earned, I could own a Rolls Royce, alhamdulillah. But I was satisfied with the Toyota car, because the beloved prophet said, make your sustenance less. And the expenditure of my house in Bombay was about 2,400 ringgit a month. And now you're aware that there are problems. The enemies of Islam are after my property, no problem. Today I require 2,000, less than 2,000 ringgit a month for me and my wife to survive. When we had the capacity where we could own a Rolls Royce, we didn't own. Now I'm not fish out of water, I'm very happy. And earning 2,000 ringgit a month is peanuts. But if I was used to the lifestyle of how much I earned before, today I would have been in misery. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in a Sahih Hadith, or Sunan at tirmidhi volume number four. Hadith number 2344, that a person who relies on Allah, as he should rely, like the birds, when they go in the morning with empty stomach, they come back with a full stomach. Allah will provide them the sustenance. That means if you have tawakkullah, tawakkul on Allah, the reliance as you should have, Allah will provide you. Like the birds, when they go out in the morning with empty stomach, they come back with a full stomach. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in Sahih Muslim, Moim number seven, Hadith number 6774, that you should not say, if so and so would have happened, then so and so thing would have been done. You know, many times we say, oh, if I had done this, you know, I would have got a better prophet. If I had done this, this would have happened. A beloved prophet said, don't say if I had done so and so, then so and so would have happened because that so and so will be the shaitan. But you say, Alhamdulillah, this is by the grace of Allah. So Muslim, when he gets a prophet, he praises Allah. When he goes in loss, he praises Allah. Because this is the qadr of Allah. This is the qadr of Allah. And I know, some of you may be aware, that most of the countries are after me because I'm uh, alhamdulillah madai. And you know, you might have heard of many allegations of terrorism, of money laundering, so much so that they want to attach all my properties. And I told my wife, that, alhamdulillah, even if the non-Muslim government, who's against Islam, takes the property of a da'i, that is alhamdulillah. The property tomorrow, if there's an earthquake, it can be into ashes. There can be a robbery, there can be a loss in the business. What better thing is it that in the way of Allah, our property is taken away? Can there be any better reward? So believe me, not even me and my wife not even thought for a second or even did not bat an eyelid. We were very happy. It is Hazam in Fazli Rabbi. It is from the grace of the Almighty God. What is in you, you'll get it. I told my wife, what can be better than a property going in the way of Allah? Imagine the reward we'll get in the Akhirah. Alhamdulillah. And we are leading a better life in Malaysia than what we used to live in Bombay. It is Allah who provides. It is the duty that a Muslim professional, he does not rely on his job for his earning. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who provides. And it is he who, alhamdulillah, gives. A beloved prophet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
he has said. And we should not lie. And I'll give you an example that very often when a salesman is trying to sell a good and he may tell that this good, the cost, the selling price, it is 100 ringgit. And you may try and bargain, why don't you give me 50 ringgit? That salesman tells you, Madam, sir, I'm hardly making a profit of five ringgit. And after negotiating, he gives you for 90 ringgit. It is very obvious the salesman was lying. If he was making a profit of five ringgit, he gives you a discount of 10 ringgit. It's not possible. Why will he lose five ringgit? For a customer, you are no relative of his. Imagine people lie to sell their good. A Muslim professional will never lie. Normally, whenever I buy goods from a hawker, I normally do not bargain. If the hawker says, this good is costing 10 ringgit, I know very well it is for 5 ringgit. I buy it for 10 ringgit. And the reason is, I believe that even though I know the object is for five ringgit, and I think he's a hawker, a poor man, I'm he saying 10 ringgit, I don't question, I give it. Why? I think it is charity with honor. Without saying it is charity, he's a poor man. He's working hard. Okay, give it to him. The actual cost is four ringgit. He should sell it for five ringgit. Instead of 20% profit, he's getting a profit of how much? Calculate fast, 150%. See, when you're talking, you should be able to calculate fast. If four ringgit, normal 20%, five ringgit, he's getting 10 ringgit, six ringgit, four ringgit, six ringgit, 150% profit. But sometimes some hawkers say, sir, it is such a cheap thing, you will get nowhere else, why don't you buy five? Now he's lying. He's lying. I know it is not cheap. He told me 10 ringgit, I didn't question him. I wanted to give charity with honor. Now he's lying. Why don't you buy five? It is very cheap, you will not get any wealth. He thinks I'm a fool. Now, a Muslim professional cannot lie. Okay, you're asking for more money, I didn't question you. You didn't lie. You got the profit, Allah gave it to you. Now, you're telling a lie. You will never, good, you will never get this anywhere so cheap. Now he's lying. So Muslim professional will never lie. Very often, businessmen, to click a deal or to get the contract, they bribe. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Hadith of Tirmidhi, volume number three, Hadith number 1337, that anyone who bribes and the person who takes bribe, Allah curses him. It's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 188, that do not use your wealth as a bait for judges so that you may eat other people's wealth. Bribing is haram in Islam. A professional may think, okay, fine, my bribe cost is only how much? 10,000 ringgit. I made a profit of 100,000 ringgit. He thinks it is beneficial. A Muslim professional will never bribe. It is prohibited. And many a times people who use fraudulent methods and bribe, whatever money they earn, it is usually wasted in calamities. Maybe he'll get sick. Maybe there's an accident in the family. So he thinks he has got 100,000 ringgit. All the money goes, there is no barqa. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it mentions on Maja, chapter number, Point number five, hadith number 4019, that do not be fraudulent in business. Do not short measure or in weight. It is prohibited for a businessman to cheat in the weight or in measurement and to do fraud. It is haram. The money that you get, it has no barqa. Maybe with the fraudulent method, he may earn 100,000 ringgit a month, but there's no barqa. It, it is wasted in accidents and calamities. 
It may, there may be a theft in your family, there may be sickness. On the other hand, a Muslim professional may earn only 5,000 ringgit, he's very satisfied. There's barqa. 5,000 ringgit sufficient. So barqa is more important than the amount of wealth. And being fraudulent in business, cheating in weighing oil, it is the six. It is the 62nd major sin in Islam. According to Imam al-Dhabi, if you defraud it in business, or if you cheat in weight and measure, it is 62 major sin. If you bribe, it is 32nd major sin in Islam. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number 13, that Allah curses a person who breaks his promise or his contract. Many a time professionals, they make a contract, they make promises which they cannot fulfill. If you cannot fulfill, Allah will curse you. A Muslim professional will never promise something which he cannot do. He will never add something in the contract which he cannot fulfill. It's prohibited. There are many professionals who normally they may cheat the company for a benefit. They may say they're bought for X amount, actually they're bought for X minus Y, thinking they're making a profit. A Muslim professional will never cheat the company he's working for. He will strive hard. Maybe he'll get a bonus. Maybe his salary will increase. The risk what is there, he will get. It will not change. Whatever he's destined to, he will achieve that. And we human beings, normally the professionals, they normally give the annual presentation. Mainly the profession of higher category, they give the annual presentation of the performance at the end of the year. And many a times, to please the superior, they boast. They boast that because of me, this company has benefited million ringgit. They boast, because of me, the company has been. Why? They want to please their superior so that their salary increases or they get a bonus. A Muslim professional will never boast. Even if he has got an income, he'll never boast because showing off, riya, it is the 37th major sin in Islam. Not only is it haram, according to Imam Dhabi, it is the 37th major sin in Islam. If a Muslim professional is giving his presentation, he will attribute all success to Allah and Allah alone. He will say, Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, when I did this work for the company, Allah benefited the company with a million ringgit. See the difference. A Muslim professional cannot show off. We human beings don't have capability of making a million ringgit profit for anyone. Leave aside company, not even for yourself. It is hazam in fazli rabbi. It is due to the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Muslim professional presentation would be by the grace of Allah, by the help of Allah, the company has benefited. Or by the help of Allah, I was able to make this benefit for the company. There's a difference. There was a lady, a woman, who used to always, her desire was, she used to complain to the son, that why is your company not giving you a lot of money? What is this monster? She used to always complain. But the son was satisfied, he said, Haz amin fadli rabbi. The mother used to always complain. Her desire was company should give more money. What happens after a few months, there's an accident and the son dies. The company had taken insurance policy. An accident, double money. The mother gets hundreds of thousands of ringgit, but now she's sad. Now she realizes that the company spent with the son was more important than the money. Allah gave the money, but took away the son. We human beings, how often do we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the niyama he's given us? for the house that he has given us, for the clothes we wear, for the food we eat. How many times do we thank Allah? Do we thank Allah for the water we get to drink? 
which is the most important thing for human being what is it don't know water if you don't get for few weeks you will die air if you don't get for few minutes you will die how many of us have thanked allah for the air we breathe raise your hand i cannot see a single hand inshallah in future do thank allah the most i am a medical doctor by profession muslim professional the most important thing for survival for a human being is air some people can survive for a couple of minutes some few minutes but no one that i know who can live for maybe half an hour or one hour without air if you don't have air you will die how often have we thanked allah for the air that he has given us free of cost how often if you realize the ni'ma of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala believe me you will be so happy that the thing i used to complain to allah because i had no shoes until i saw a man who had no feet i used to complain to allah because i had no shoes until i saw a man who had no feet a beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that when you look what we do normally we look at our friends oh my friend oh you know has a mercedes car how good has such a beautiful villa with in five bedroom i have only three bedroom you normally compare yourself with your friends and your relatives and you envy them for the more wealth they have for the luxury they have our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said as far as worldly things are compared as far as worldly things are taken into consideration compare yourself with those who are below you you should look at the poor people they're living in hut at least you have a two bedroom apartment look at the people they don't have food to eat in so many parts of the world at least you have food to eat people don't have clothes to wear so if you look at the people below you for worldly things you will thank allah more but as far as virtue is con- concerned look at the people above you ah that person he's so pious i wish i was as pious as him mashallah he offers all his salah for sunnat muqadda sunnat ghair muqadda i wish he was i was as good as him in salah oh he is a knowledgeable person he is a muhaddis i wish i was a muhaddis mashallah he is a mufassir i wish i was a mufassir mufassir oh he is a dai i wish i was a dai so in, in things which are islamic of virtue look at the people above you this is the golden rule and believe me you will be a satisfied person happiness it is a mental state many people think that the billionaires are happy let me tell you most of the billionaires are not happy most of them are not happy we think okay if we had all the luxury we would be happy you know there's a person who's a villager who looks on the highway at a car going by oh wish i had a car villager he sees on the highway oh i wish i had a car once he comes to a comes to the town city and allah gives him a car he says wish i had a three bedroom apartment allah gives him a three bedroom apartment then he says wish i had a five bedroom villa allah gives him a villa then he says wish i have an then he become very rich become the billionaire oh wish i have a outhouse you know a farm in the village side and he comes back to where he was because when allah gives you more wealth to realize the beauty of the nature what allah has given free is more valuable than all the luxury which you are craving for so we should always look at people below you that will get you closer to allah subhanahu wa taala and allah says in the quran allah says in the quran that allah subhanahu wa taala gives sustenance to people without measure in several places in the quran in surah imran chapter number 3 verse number 27 
Allah says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 30. Allah says in Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse number 62. Allah says in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34. Verse number 62, verse number 39. Allah says in Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 52, that Allah gives sustenance to whoever he wishes without measures. If Allah wants to give sustenance, he can give sustenance to anyone without measure. And the best example, the best professional I can think in the Sahabas was Abdurrahman bin Auf. Who has heard of Abdurrahman bin Auf? Who has heard of the Sahaba, the companion of the Prophet, Abdurrahman bin Auf? Please raise your hand. MashaAllah. Quite a few know. He was a person, he was a professional businessman. He had so much taqwa in Allah, tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he did hijrat from Makkah to Medina, many of the Ansar, they told to the Muhajir, you can take our wealth. No problem. So one person comes, one Ansar comes to Abdurrahman bin Auf and says that you can take half my wealth. I have many wives, whichever you like, you can ask for, I will divorce her. He said, no, show me the place to the market. It's a very famous hadith. He goes to the market and comes back with all the wealth. He had so much taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most important is taqwa. Allah says in Surah Hujura, chapter number 49, verse number 13, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, oh you believe. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, Ya ayyuhal ladhina, that, oh humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female. Ya ayyuhal nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum, shu'umbam wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu, inna kramukun inda la yatkaakum inna la alibun khabir. O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female, and have divided you into nations and tribes, so that you may recognize each other, not that you may despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah is the person who has taqwa. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not wealth, it is not color, it is not sex, it is taqwa, it is righteousness. The only way that one human being can be superior to the other human being is with taqwa. It is righteousness. We come to the last part of my talk, with a few minutes remaining. Let me ask you a question. Which is the best profession in the world? Can't hear. Which is the best profession in the world? Teacher. Teacher. Any other? Oh, they're clapping, teacher. You know, when you look around in the world, do most of the parents want the children to be teacher? When you do a survey, majority of the human in the world, they would want their children to become doctor. Survey, survey. Why? Doctor. I want to make my son, my daughter a doctor. Majority, not all. Some may say number two, or some may say number one, engineer. Some may say management expert. What does Allah say? Which is the best profession? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Allah says, Woman ahsan qala mimman doil Allahi, wa amana salihaw, qala inna mina muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says that I am a Muslim. According to our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best profession is the person who calls people towards Allah. The best profession is the profession of a da'i. Who says that? Not Dr. Zakir Naik. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33. I started my talk with the verse of the Quran from Sulal Imran, chapter number three, verse number 110. Allah says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people, excellent people. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for humankind. 
tu'amiruna bil ma'rufi wa tanawna in munkar because you enjoin what is good and you forbid what is wrong and you believe in Allah Allah is calling us Muslims as the best of people why because we enjoy what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah because we are doing a small part time dai's role if you do not enjoy what is good and if you do not forbid what is wrong you are unfit to be called as muslims you are unfit to be called as khaira ummah Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 143 that we have made you an ummah wasp a middle most community so that you may be a witness over the nations and the messenger will be a witness over you Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter number 3 verse number 104 let there arise out of you a band of people a group of people that invite people to the good and forbid them from doing wrong these are the ones that shall attain felicity here Allah is talking about full time dais duats you know we are full time doctors full time engineers full time lawyers full time management experts how many full time expert dai do we have how many you know when i say a professional dai when i say professional doctor means in the world maybe we have hundreds of thousands of muslim doctors but yet we have thousands of well known muslim doctor you can name a few here in kedah in kuala lumpur in other parts in malaysia there'll be few hundred in other parts of thousands we have professional doctors we have professional lawyers we have professional engineers how many expert dai do we have we can count them on your fingertips here allah is saying in surah imran chapter 3 verse number 104 these full time dai it's not fard for everyone these full time dai are the one that will attain a higher level in jannah higher level Allah says in Surah Al-Asr chapter number 103 verse number 1 to 3 which is called as Rahi Nijat Allah says wal asr innal insana lafi khus illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bis sabr by the token of time man is well in a state of loss except those who have faith those who do righteous deed those who exhort people to truth do dawa those who exhort people to patience and perseverance these are the minimum four criteria required for any human being to go to jannah iman number 1 righteous deed number 2 wa tawasaw bil haqqi inviting people to truth You may be a very good Muslim. May, you may be praying five times a day. You may be having the mark on your forehead. You may be fasting in the month of Ramadan. You may have gone for Hajj. You may be giving zakat. But if you don't do dawa, if you don't invite people to the truth and forbid them from wrong, according to Surah Asr, you shall not go to Jannah. And the fourth criteria is what was so be sabr, inviting people to sabr. All four criteria are equally important for any human being to Jannah. If anyone is missing under normal circumstances, you shall not go to Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you and put you in Jannah, it is His prerogative. According to Imam Shafi'i, Rahim Allah, may Allah bless you on him, he said that if this Surah Al Asr was alone to be revealed. even if this one surah was revealed it was sufficient for the hidayah of human kind it was sufficient for the guidance of human kind so powerful is this verse so powerful is this surah according to surah it's compulsory every muslim should at least be a part time dai at least part time dai but if you're a full time dai higher level in jannah Allah says in Surah An-Nahl chapter 16 verse number 125 Udu ila sabili rabbika bihikma wal mu'azzati lasna wajadul mut'asan invite all to the way of thy lord with the wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the way that the best and most gracious when you call people when you do dawa do it with hikma and with husna invite them in the way that the best and most gracious Today, unfortunately, we find that people have commercialized this beautiful profession of a dai. Unfortunately, when we look at the non-Muslims preaching the religion and you know charging money, unfortunately, many of our Muslim dais are following that. 
It started from the Western world, now it is spread throughout the world. Not all, but many of the guys, they demand that unless you don't give me a thousand dollars, I will not give a lecture. They will demand that unless you don't give me a business class ticket, I will not come for the lecture. Business class aeroplane ticket. Unless you don't give me in a five-star hotel, I will not give a lecture. Demanding money for giving a lecture and saying, unless you don't give me a thousand dollars, I will not come, it is not accepted. If someone gives you willingly, alhamdulillah, no problem. But demanding all these things, five-star hotel, yes, if you're doing a job as a dai, getting salary is perfectly all right. You better do a job and work for an Islamic organization and take a salary than working in a normal company. Good, you're a full-time guy. But demanding money for giving lecture, it's not correct. We will not go into this detail. I remember that when I was young, now also, mashallah, I'm young. I wanted to become a doctor. Why? I thought, not for money, my father, mashallah, he was a psychiatrist, he was a doctor, my brother was a doctor, he is a doctor. Even I wanted to become a doctor. Why? I thought it was the most noble profession, you know, saving human lives, for serving humanity. Money wasn't the criteria. And doctor is a good profession. But when I met Sheikh Ahmad Didad, the guy from South Africa, Raimullah, may Allah have mercy on him, may Allah grant him Jannah, I changed from a doctor of a body to doctor of a soul. I passed my medical graduation. But when I met him, I found Doctor is a good profession, but die is a better profession, as Allah says in the Quran. So I changed from a doctor of a body to doctor of a soul. My mother, she wanted me to become like Dr. Chris Bernard. Dr. Chris Bernard, if you don't know, is the first doctor in the world who did a heart transplant in a human being. And he too happens to come from South Africa like Sheikh Ahmed Didar. So she wanted me to become like Dr. Chris Bernard, a heart specialist. So when I met Sheikh Didat, I wanted to become a dai. So I asked my mother, that mommy, do you want me to become like Dr. Chris Bernard or like Sheikh Ahmed Didat? So my mother being intelligent, she told me both. <laughs> then mashallah, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first I told my parents that I will give two hours a week for dawah, so because being in the medical profession. While I was doing my internship, then I said, okay, fine, I will give two hours a day. Then I requested my parents, and my parents agreed. I'll give 50% dawa, 50% medical practice. They said, no problem. Then I said, two hours medical practice, remaining dawa, they said, no problem. Then I said, full-time dai, they said, no problem. After I started giving lecture, and when I asked the same question to my mother, that, mommy, do you want me to become like Dr. Chris Bernard or like Sheikh Ahmed Didad, she replied, I would sacrifice a thousand Chris Bernard for one Sheikh Didat. And people who know my background, if you know my background, I was a stammerer. From childhood, from the time I was born, I was a stammerer. If you'd ask, what is your name? I would say, my name is Da, 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 I was a stammerer. In school, during public speech, they used to give me PF, pass fail. Actually fail, but because, you know, I'm a poor person, stammerer. We can't fail him, so they used to give me PF, pass fail. In my dream, I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world. But in my dream, I couldn't have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what you cannot dream, has I been fuzzy rabbi. For my lecture, thousands of people come. Two years back, in Kuala Lumpur, in the Bakati in Kuala Lumpur, in the Bukijali Stadium, there were 50,000 people. One year before, in Jakarta, Bakasi Stadium, 100,000 people. 
in India when I give lectures, few hundred thousand people. Largest gathering I addressed, more than a million people, alhamdulillah. And the reason I'm telling you this, wallahi, by Allah, it is not to show off. If I'm showing off, it is, it is the 17th major, not for showing off, it's 37th major sin. It is not for Riyah. The reason I'm telling you is because most of the Muslims think, die! The moment they think of a die, we are, you know, maybe going in a rickshaw. Person who's not very proficient. Who's to blame? We are to blame. What do we do? And I'm giving you wallahi to show you. Most of us, what we do, if a child fails in the examination, we want to make him Hafiz al Quran. If he fails in the school, we want to make him an alim. So we have rejects of our society becoming alim. Why don't you say that if my son has passed the medical college, okay, now he's fit to become a dai? In our school in Bombay, Islamic International School, excellent school, alhamdulillah, 50% of the people, we want them to become doctors, engineers, lawyers, 50% dais, Islamic scholars, the best 50% become Islamic scholars. The lower people become doctors and engineers. We should sacrifice the best for the sake of Allah. Why? So today most of us feel that, okay, die means, you know, miskeen, needy person. And people tell them, oh, Zakir, you're a fool. You gave up your medical profession. I'm giving you the examples of my life not to show off. Allah says in the Quran, give charity secretly and openly. Showing off for charity is prohibited, but if you show to others, to encourage others to give charity, that's permitted. Give charity without your left, when a right hand gives charity, left should not know, good. But sometimes you may have to tell people to encourage other people. Today I'm going to give you some points of my life, not to show off. Showing off is a major sin, wallahi, only to show you that this concept that a dai is miskin is totally wrong. Imagine if I was the best doctor in the world, would all of you come here? Yes? Would 100,000 people come in Jakarta? Would 50,000 people come in Kuala Lumpur to listen to the best doctor in the world? No. Hazam in Fazlirabbe in India, more than a million people live. More than a million people live. World record, no religious speaker in the world has ever given live solo one lecture. Yes, there are conferences where there are many speakers where bigger audiences have come. But for a single lecture, I don't know anywhere in the world, no, no non-Muslim preacher also has got more than a million people, alhamdulillah. It's only because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. According to me, there are a million people in the world, millions of people in the world who have more knowledge than me. There are millions of people who are better speakers than me. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine a stammerer now giving lecture to thousands and hundred thousand million people. It is only and only hundred percent because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the power of Allah. I'm giving the example only to show you that if Allah is with you, he takes you on top of the world. And you know when the more popular you get and the more people accept Islam because of the dawa, you find the enemies of Islam come against you. And they started in 2010 when the Peace TV got more popular. And the UK government, they excluded me officially, not allowed to enter the country. I thought, khalas. If UK bans a Muslim die, then most of the Muslim countries get scared. So I thought, okay, we'll continue, no problem. In 2013, alhamdulillah, Sheikh Muhammad of Dubai, the ruler of Dubai, gives me the Dubai Holy, Inter Dubai Holy International Award of Personality of the Year. I was the 17th person, the youngest Muslim to get that award, alhamdulillah. Summa alhamdulillah. It is the second most prestigious award in the world. Along with it, I get a million dirham, a little bit more than a million ringgit. After that, a few months later, July 13, I get the Holy Quran Award. 
In November 2013, Malaysia Agong at that time caused me to give the Toko Mahalijri Award. The Toko Mahalijri Award, as you know, is given regularly to a local only every year. Once in a blue moon, they give to a foreigner. I was the fourth foreigner at that time to get the International Toko Mahalijri Award. Few months later, in 2014, I get the award of the Sharjah. Then 2014, December, I get the highest award of Gambia by the president of Gambia. In 2015, March, Alhamdulillah, the International King Faisal Award given by King Salman. It is the highest Islamic award in the world. <laughs> highest Islamic equivalent to the Nobel Prize. And normally this award, most of them you see are kings. King Khalid got, King Abdullah got, and prime ministers and presidents. Your Sun uh, uh, got that award. The King of Sharjah got that award. Hardly few dies. It was Sheikh Ahmed Didad in 1986 who got the award, and I said, Hada bin Fadli Rabbi. In 2015, Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, they awarded me. To tell you, people think that I've sacrificed a profession. They are the biggest, they are the fools, not me. I did not sacrifice anything. Allah gave me fame multiple times. We never did for fame. We never did. And every time a large audience come, at the night we pray to Allah. It is the shaitan who will be after you. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Furqan chapter 35 verse number 31, Surah Furqan chapter 25 verse 31, that for every prophet there is an enemy. And dies are doing the job of the prophet, delivering the message. The more famous you get, the more the shaitan is after you. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that please save me from the Satan. As I told you, more power, more fame, you know, more arrogance come. You have to be more humble. Imagine this person who used to stammer, get the King Faisal Award, along with 750,000 riyal, equal to 800,000. All this, mashallah, works for Peace TV. Works. You know, there was an airline which has to travel very often. I won't take the name of that airline because it's a Muslim airline. They offered me that if you allow us to write on our brochure, Dr. Zakir Naik flies in so-and-so airline. And that was a fact. I most often used to travel in that airline. If you allow us to write in our brochure, Dr. Zakir Naik flies in that airline, we will give you $250,000 every year, free ticket, you and your family, any five-star hotel you want to stay. If our plane doesn't go, you can take any other plane, first-class ticket. $250,000, one million ringgit every year, only to write on our brochure, Dr. Zakir Naik flies in our airlines. I'm, I'm telling you this not to show off. I'm telling you to, giving you the example of showing the niyama of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One million ringgit worth of air ticket free, food, hotel, anywhere in the world, full family. But I rejected it. You know why? Because that airline serves alcohol. It says halal food, but not halal drinks. What is one million ringgit? Nothing. The two rakats I pray in the Fajr, that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, the two rakats you pray in the Fajr is more valuable than the world and the wealth in it. So what is a million ringgit? So if you know the value of Islam and your salah, who would want the million ringgit? And believe me, on average in Bombay, I used to spend 17 hours a day in my office. Our office used to work 25. 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day. I have to spend about 17 hours a day. During the holidays, maybe two days a month, I have to do personal business. Maybe less than three weeks a year. Profit? Millions of dollars. Barakah. So why should I ask for money for giving lecture? Allah is giving it directly. Millions of dollars. Multiply by four and ring it. For working hardly two, three weeks a year. You invest in Allah gives you. The best investment is with Allah. 
I'm telling you this not to show off, to tell you that this person standing in front of you who was a stammerer, couldn't have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. Hadha bin Fazl Rabbi by the Niyama of Allah. MashaAllah, Facebook, 17.4 million. 17 million. You know, this doesn't carry any value. But if you're looking at worldly things, most of the Muslims think Daim is miskin. Here you have an example in front of you because of the grace of Allah standing in front of you. MashaAllah. Followers are millions, even enemies are large, MashaAllah. So much so that today, most of the countries are after me, majority. You know, in India, about two years and four months back, in November 2016, they banned the organization. I'll come to my organization afterwards. And the present prime minister, the Narendra Modi, I would like to thank him. He's the prime minister now, elections are going on. After one and a half months, whether he remains or not, Allah wa'alam. Allah wa'alam. Maybe, may not be, I don't know. But presently, he's the prime minister. The government is so much against me, they spend tens of millions of dollars to propagate against me on the television channels, in the newspaper, that Zakir is a terrorist. He's promoting terrorism. And they could not find hate speech. Then they say money laundering. And so many years I'm giving everything clearly to the income tax. This is what I earn. I'm an NRI non-resident Indian from Dubai. No questions asked. Now when the government is against me, now they're saying money laundering. They're laying allegations. They're laying allegations, public fund, misuse. Get me one person, not to one person, with a receipt who has given any money to the organization and that was not used for the activity. But why do I thank Modi? Why? The reason is that previously, maybe, maybe two-thirds, 65% of the Muslims knew me, and maybe about 10% non, 10 of non-Muslims did not know. 10% non-Muslims knew me. Now, after spending millions of dollars in propaganda against me through television channels for his vote bank, today, mashallah, more than 90% of the Muslims in India know me, and more than two-thirds of the non-Muslims know me. Previously, maybe 15% of Indians knew me now. More than two-thirds know me, alhamdulillah. Those who had seen my lectures before, what are they doing? They are doing duas for me. May Allah save this day of Islam. May Allah give them jazakir. Those who don't know me, have not seen my lecture, they get influenced by the media and they're cursing me. Now when someone curses you wrongly, a beloved prophet said, it benefits you. If someone curses you wrongly on the day of judgment, what will happen? I will get his good deeds. If his good deeds are over, my bad deeds will go to him. Prophet. So I'm thanking Modi. Now there are millions of people doing dua for me. Mashallah. Those who knew me. There are a bigger number of people who are cursing me. Both ways I'm benefiting. Hazam in Fazirab. What we realize that as da'is of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to follow Quran and Sunnah. We have to strive and leave the results for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will save you. And if anything happens, we are happy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we know that the fourth caliph, the second caliph of Islam, Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. If you read, the Fadail al Sahaba by Imam Ahmad, hadith number 1280, he asked the Sahabas, What would you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill this room up so that you could spend it in the way of Allah? So one Sahaba says, I will pray to Allah to let this room be filled up with gold so that I could spend in the way of Allah. So Hazrat Umar, he says, Ask for something better. 
So another Sahaba says, I will pray to Allah to let this room be filled up with rubies and jewels and diamonds so that I could spend it in the way of Allah. Umar radiallahu anh says, ask for something better. So the Sahaba says, Ya Amirul Mu'mineen, O leader of the believers, you tell what is better. So he replies, I will pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let this room be filled up with Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, Muad bin Jabal, Hudayfa bin Yaman, the great dais, so that I could send them to spread the message of Allah. See the hikmah of Umar radiallahu anh. He doesn't ask for gold. He doesn't ask for diamonds and jewels. He asks for manpower, professionals. Like Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, Muad bin Jabal. These people were great dais so that he could send them to spread the message of Allah. What did our prophet leave behind? Did he leave behind gold? Did he leave behind wealth? He left behind sahabas. Today we Muslims have the maximum wealth in the world. We have the black gold, we have the oil. Today the Muslims are looked down upon, right or wrong? Right or wrong? Today we have all the wealth in the world. According to me, out of the hundreds richest people in the world, 95% are Muslims. Bill Gates is nothing. I personally know many Arab businessmen who can have Bill Gates in their pocket. It's only in the Forbes list, Bill Gates, now it is Jeff because There are many Muslims, multiple times richer than Bill Gates and Jeff because We have the money, but today we Muslims are looked down upon. Why? At that time, the Sahabas were there. We spread the deen. We were the most powerful people in the world. The Muslims were the torchbearers because we were close to Quran and Sunnah. Today, we are looked down upon because we have gone away from Quran and Sunnah. So my request to my brothers and sisters is that come close to Quran and Sunnah. Become a true Muslim profession. Become a true Muslim professional. And inshallah, you will conquer the world. I would like to end my speech with the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, where Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحَسَنُ قَالَ مِمَّنْ ضَوَيْ لَلَّهِ وَعَمِلُ صَالِحَوْ قَالَ إِنَّ نِمْلَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the work of the Lord? And he says that I am a Muslim. وَآخِرُ الدَّوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ To Dr. Zakir Naik, thank you very much for a very, very inspiring speech, very energetic, and so many excellent points that we can learn today from our distinguished speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik, on Muslim professionals. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will move on to the next session. More stimulating, inshallah, more engaging the Q&A session. And on that, we divide the audience into eight points. So on my left-hand side, we start with a first point, second point, then at the back, the third point, and fourth point. Our sisters uh, up there, the fifth point, then the sixth point here, a seventh point up there, and the eighth point there. Is that clear? So I may give the rotation uh, according to the numbers. Okay? Uh, by the way, not necessarily to start with one, two, three, four. I may call one, then uh, seven, and then uh, second, then eight, and so on, okay? <clears throat> and to derive more benefit for all present here today, in the limited time available, we would like the following guidelines or rules to be observed during the questions and answer session. 
in the interest of getting a proper and clear answer from the speaker, kindly state your name and profession before putting forth your question. Uh, questions asked should be on the topic only. Questions not relevant to the topic will not be entertained. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. A short and sweet, please. This is a question and answer time and not a lecture or a debate time. Only one question at a time may be asked. For your second questions, you will have to go at the back of the row again and await your second chance for questioning. Uh, eight marks have been provided for the questions from the audience. And as I mentioned, that uh, we have eight points altogether uh, in this hall. And our uh, committees, uh, the assistant will help you as well uh, to ensure that you can uh, ask the questions uh, very nicely. We will allow one question on each of the mics in a clockwise rotation and written questions on slips of paper which are available from our volunteers in the sites would be given secondary preference after the open questions on the mics are answered by the speaker. In the interest of not having any time wasted on irrelevant issues and to ensure a more educative and an interesting question and answer session, our decision to allow or disallow irrelevant questions will be final. Would that, would that be okay for you, uh, brothers and sisters? Alhamdulillah. So now we will start with a question number one from point one. Uh, please. Uh, go to the mic, please. Jazakallah. I would like to make a request that if we have any non-Muslims in the audience, we would uh, prefer giving them the first option of asking the question. Our non-Muslim brothers and sisters, they are the guest of honors for this program today. If there are any non-Muslims in the audience who would like to ask a question, they would be given the first preference. So surely they can break the queue. If a non-Muslim would like to ask a question, they can come on the microphone and they can raise their hand they would be given the first preference. Are there any non-Muslim brothers and sisters in the audience who would like to ask a question? Feel free you can ask any question. Even if it's out of the topic, no problem. For the non-Muslims, if they can ask any question. You don't have to agree with me, you can disagree with me also. <laughs> yes, brother. Your name and your profession. Uh... Sebelum saya mengucap, uh, uh, saya nak kata dua perkataan dulu, uh, iaitu uh, 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 saya kena terima kasih dulu lah kepada Allah Ta'ala uh, pasal saya, saya datang ke sini. Uh, saya nak tanya dalam bahasa Malaysia lah, pasal saya, bahasa Inggeris saya kurang faham. Uh, Allah Ta'ala cipta manusia. Uh, uh, sorry dari, brother, can you state your name and profession uh, please? Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, nama saya Tachina Murti Analaki Subramaniam. Uh, Brother, if you know English, it's better. Because uh, I don't understand Malay. If I know, you, I know English, English cannot. I am Malay. Okay, so we'll ask the coordinator to yeah. translate in English, inshallah. Okay. No problem. Okay. You can ask the question in Malay, okay. and the coordinator okay. will translate it, inshallah. Saya nak tanya, banyak saya dah baca, banyak saya dengar dalam bab-bab agama Islam iaitu Rasulullah saya tahu lah dia uh, saya mula-mula saya dengar dalam dalam ni Islam ya mula-mula Allah hantar manusia ke dunia ini uh, melalui Adam dan Hawa. Jadi uh, kita dari start dari Adam dan Hawa. Jadi mula-mula uh, mula-mula uh, dari Adam dulu, dari Adam yang masa uh, semasa uh, semasa satu uh, dia dia buat kesilapan satu iaitu uh, uh, Allah beritahu jangan makan buah itu tapi dia bi makan buah itu. 
Lepas itu Allah Allah kata Allah bagi dia turun ke ke dunia ini dengan lepas itu dia seorang saja dia seorang saja lepas itu dia sedih lepas itu Allah hantar seorang apa dia ambil dari dari demi ini demi rasul demi apa 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 tulang rasul dia, dia bagi satu wanita kat dia lepas itu dari start tu dari satu manusia sudah sudah bermula dari manusia sudah bermula dari mula dari mula dari mula dari start dari itu manusia dia berpindah pindah pindah lama ke lama lama ke lama dia pindah pindah dia sudah pergi dia pergi negeri China dari China dia pergi dari India dari India jadi kita semua mai datang dari Allah dari Tuhan satu kenapa kita asing asingkan you lain saya lain itu lain kenapa cakap macam tu tak boleh itu itu okay. kesalahan itu kesalahan manusia. Okey. Uh, uh, saya so dengar saya uh, dengar Rasulullah uh, Rasulullah saya dengar adalah uh, radio India. Uh, okay, so so, so itu itu soalannya ke? Brother, brother the speech time is over. This okay. is a question answer time. Okay okay. Uh, the coordinator rightly said that the question should be in two or three sentences. More okay. than that is a speech. Okay okay. <laughs> Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, brother, itukah soalannya? Okay, okay itu, itu soalan. Uh, okay, satu lagi saya nak beritahu. Uh, jadi Rasulullah ada beritahu. Dia, dia, uh, dia kata suruh belajar sampai negeri China. Uh, itu satu. Lepas itu, uh, itu kafir itu, kafir itu apa dia? Saya nak tanya, kafir itu, uh, uh, saya tahu, dia bagi, uh, Allah beritahu, itu kafir itu, dia... Orang yang tak uh, orang yang uh, apa orang yang tak ingat kepada Tuhan itu itu orang ya, orang kata kafir tapi you uh, I tengok orang-orang Islam lain pada lain pada bangsa lain you orang kata kafir kafir saya pun heranlah kenapa cakap macam tu ha ah, kita semua datang okay. dari Allah dari Tuhan uh, kenapa okay, jadi uh, saya faham soalan yang uh, dikemukakan ya yeah, ya yeah. okey uh, thank you very much terima kasih duit ucapkan yeah. i'm trying to summarize what he want to ask. Okay. Uh, first, it is about uh, the creation of... Brother, uh, first I request you that please don't allow such long questions. You are setting the rules of the rules of question and session, you're breaking it yourself. If you have set the rule, you said two or three sentences. If he's speaking more, you should have made it short because it's not possible to repeat everything. And then I will not give a very appropriate answer. So see to it that if someone gives a long question answer, Long question. More than more than three sentences, cut it off, please. Okay. So that we allow others to ask the question. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Please. So the, the question relates to the creation of uh, the first men, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, that uh, come from uh, one creation uh, that supposedly all will be the same. Uh, but why? It has been diverse and uh, varied. Uh, from here and there. There is Malay, Chinese, Indians, and so on. Okay, and then, um, it's about the, the notion of uh, kafir. That how? One question, the second question. Okay. <laughs> you said in your rules that ask one question at a time, okay. second question go behind and you're not stopping him. Okay. You are giving a lecture on professionalism following rules and regulation. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. First time allowed. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. You are a professional, not a Muslim professional. Yes. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Dr. Zakir, uh, on uh, the notion on uh, kafir and the misconception and even sometimes misunderstanding among the Muslims uh, themselves that uh, sometimes they may easily call somebody kafir just because of different races. The brothers asked two questions. The first question is that we have been created from one pair of male and female, the Adam peace be upon him, and Eve may Allah be peace with her. How we have different races, Malay, Chinese, Indian, how we have different color. This was answered in my lecture, and I quoted a verse of the Quran of Surah Hujurat, chapter number 14 and verse number 13, which says, Ya ayyuwa nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shawmba wa qaba ila litarafu inna kramuk min dalla yatkaakum inna Allah alimun khabir. We say, O oh, humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female. 
and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored is the person who has taqwa. Allah says in the Quran, we have created you from a single pair, Adam and Eve, peace be upon them. And have divided you into nations and tribes, Malay, Chinese, Indian, African, American, so that you may recognize each other, okay, you are Malay, okay, you are from Malaysia. You are Chinese, you are from China. You are Indian, you are from India. You are white, you are from Western country. This is the Quran thing. So that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. Oh, I'm a Malay, I'm superior. You know, I'm a Chinese, I'm superior. A beloved prophet said, no Arab is superior to a non-Arab. No white is superior to a black. Neither a black is superior to a white. So here we come to know Allah divided so that you can come to know your origin. And as we know in medical science, as you keep on dividing, the differences keep on coming due to the DNA. Allah further says in Surah Rum chapter number 30 that he has made different languages and different colors so that you may know each other. So this is the variety of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Different types of people. But a prophet said, no Arab is superior to a non-Arab. Not a non-Arab superior to an Arab. No black, don't say you're Arab, therefore you're superior. No white is superior to a black, nor a black over a white. Color does not make you superior. Race does not make you superior. Wealth does not make you superior, except taqwa, that is God conscious. More a person is God conscious, more the person is righteous, he's superior, irrespective whether he's an Indian or a Chinese or a Malay. The more righteous the person is, <coughs> the more superior he is. This is mentioned in the Quran, also mentioned in the talk. Now coming to the second part of the question, that why do people call non-Muslim as kafir? And why do they look down upon them? What is the misconception? Kafir is the Arabic word coming from the root word kufr, means to hide something or to reject something. Kufr. To hide, to reject. In Islamic context, kafir is a person who rejects Islam. In English, it is non-Muslim. So if a non-Muslim is telling me, why are you calling me non-Muslim? So I have to call him a non-Muslim. If you say, don't call me a non-Muslim, then I'll say, say the shahada, I will call you Muslim. So kafir means basically non-Muslim. So why are they feeling it is bad? A non-Muslim is a non-Muslim. So why should he feel bad? It's Arabic word. If you translate non-Muslim into Arabic, it is kafir, one who rejects Islam. So if someone is feeling bad that don't call me kafir, then you should then you accept Islam, we'll call him Muslim. Hope that answers Thank the question. You. Can we have the next question? Seven, please, if any. From any non-Muslim. Any non-Muslim who has a question, Please come to any of the eight microphone. Any non-Muslim. Please feel free, you're most welcome to ask any questions. Anything on the topic, out of the topic, no problem. Any non-Muslim. On any of the eight mics. Any non-Muslim? A non-Muslim brother, a non-Muslim sister, have any question? You're most welcome. I was told that the university has a large percentage of non-Muslim. Not majority, but quite a substantial. Any non-Muslims? Don't feel shy. This is your opportunity. You don't have to agree with me. Only give me the reason why you don't agree. Any non-Muslim? MashaAllah, when we have programs outside, the non-Muslim questions never end. I was two years back in Kuala Lumpur. The, it was a program, longest program of my life, six and a half hours continuously. Two and a half hours lecture, four hour question and answer session. Started at 8.30, 9 o'clock, started ended at 3.30 in the morning. Six and a half hours, only non-Muslims. Only last one round we gave to Muslims. Non-Muslims did not finish. Why, Kedah is different. 
any non-Muslims? Or the Muslims that are scared away the non-Muslim? <laughs> if there are no non-Muslim, then we can continue the question and session with the Muslims. Uh, please, point number seven. And after number seven will be number two. Assalamualaikum, Doctor. My name is Asri Tadi and I'm a student in international uh, business. Sorry, not very clear. My name is Asri Tadi and I'm a student in international business. I would love to ask your opinion in sex education, where it is quite a little bit sensitive in our country, as well for the student. So in your opinion, Doctor, if the subject had been hailed, what is the duty of a Muslim as a professional other than just teaching, and also what is the duty of a Muslim as a professional as sister, a student? Sister, can you speak a bit slowly and loudly? <laughs> can you repeat the question slowly and loudly? Even the microphone, I mean, the, I cannot hear your voice clearly. Okay. Can you hold the microphone close to your mic, uh, uh, to your mouth, please? Okay, okay. Hello? Yes, yeah, that's better. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So my question is Mashallah. about your opinion in sex education, where it is quite sensitive in our country. So in your opinion, doctor, if the subject had been healed, what is the duty of a Muslim as a professional other than just teaching? And also what is the duty of a Muslim as a professional, as a student? That's my question. Thank you, doctor. The sister of the question, that if there is sex education, then what is duty as a Muslim should be allowed, and duty as a student that should be undergo that sex education. Sister, if the sex education you're giving is within the purview of the Quran and Sunnah, it is perfectly fine. But if it is outside the purview of Quran and Sunnah, it is prohibited. Now let me explain to you my answer. That sex education, I'm a medical doctor. Sex education is a vast terminology. While giving sex education, if you break the haya, the modesty level, and break any rule of Quran and Sunnah, it is prohibited. For example, I, as a medical doctor, I would say that, okay, I will tell to the gents, don't have sexual intercourse during menstruation, sex education, no problem. But if I break the haya and try and show a model of a woman in front of a gent, it is not permitted. So as long as you do not break any ruling of the Quran and Sunnah and then impart the education, no problem. But if you break any rule of the Quran and Sunnah, it is prohibited for a teacher to teach, it is prohibited for a student to learn. Hope that answers the question. It's a generic answer. So sex education is a vast terminology. But if you are talking about sex education of the Western country, most of it is haram. I'm a medical doctor. And it doesn't benefit, it causes more loss to the student than benefit. So as long as the education doesn't break any rules of the Quran and Sunnah, it is permitted. But what we learn in the Western education or sex education, most of it, it against the teaching of Quran and Sunnah, the way it is taught. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. And uh, we move to a point number... Uh, number two, please. Number two. I'm sorry, I think we're wasting too much of time in between the questions. If you allow me to handle, if you don't mind, please. I would like that the microphone should be reduced because we don't understand where is. Never did I have eight microphones, it's too much in a small auditorium. Anyway, we'll go in a clockwise fashion so it becomes faster. Because if you're going here and there, people are confused. Mm -hmm. So, can we go in a clockwise fashion? Because you said yep. in your rules from it's left to right. Up. So, if no one is on the microphone, we skip the microphone. 
the so number two there. Uh, so if you go in order, not one seven. One after one comes two. After two comes three. After three comes four. So if you go from one to seven, the person in microphone two is shocked. Why are you missing? I learned mathematics. After one comes two. After two comes three. After three comes four. So we go in a clockwise fashion. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We come back to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If there is someone which is not there on that microphone, we go to the next number. So everyone is aware, and the cameraman also aware where to go, because now this program is going live. This program is being live, telecast on the Facebook and the YouTube, and millions of people are watching. So if we leave a gap so long, everyone, you know, it's late in the night. So let's not waste time between the questions. If you see my program, it is one after the other. So please, can we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, mm -hmm. in a clockwise fashion, okay. and go fast, please. Uh, now, point number two. Number two. <laughs> Where is number two? Assalamu alaikum, doctor. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is UNE. I'm from Thailand, actually, and I'm studying here in Islamic finance and banking. Um, I would like to express my gratitude as I'm so overwhelming having been a part of this event. However, my question to you is about the role of Muslim professional. As nowadays, the uh, woman position has been considered differently from the past. Like, women can be the leader, women can work outside, but if Look, we looking for into the Quran or our Hadith. Actually, we women are not allowed going with our mahram or anything else. And also, there is the idea which is in, uh, gender equality. So, to summarize my questions again, your suggestion to the Muslim professional role. Thank you. If I understood the question correctly. The sister is saying that now there are Muslims also who are professional women. Is there gender equity in Islam? And can a woman do all the jobs, if I understand the question correctly? Sister, if you hear my talk on women's rights in Islam, Islam believes in equality between men and women. Men and women are equal, but they aren't identical. Men and women are equal, but they aren't identical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the woman different than the man. Biologically, they're different. Physically, they're different. Psychologically, they're different. Each has a different role. I cannot say, you know, I'm equal to the woman, therefore I want to become a mother. I cannot. Can I become a mother? I cannot. A woman, she's a mother. Allah has made biologically a woman. She's meant to be a better mother, a man. A woman can take care of a child better than a man. We have in the Western world women going for work and the father doing babysitting. Upside down world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our beloved Prophet Muhammad is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Before I give this hadith, I would like to give a brief that overall men and women are equal, they are, but they are not identical. And let me give you an example. If suppose in examination, there are many students appearing for the examination, two of them, they come out first. Student A, he gets 80 out of 100. Student B gets 80 out of 100. There are 10 questions, each carrying 10 marks. If you analyze the answer sheet, in answer number one, student A gets nine out of 10, student B gets seven out of 10. So in answer number one, student A has advantage over student B. In answer number two, B gets nine out of 10, student A gets seven out of 10. So in answer number two, student B has advantage over A. In the remaining eight questions, both of them get eight out of 10. If you add up, both get 80 out of 100, they're equal. But in answer to question one, student A has a degree of advantage. In answer to question two, student B has a degree of advantage. Similarly, men and women overall are equal. In some aspects, they are identical. Not in all the aspects. They're biologically different, 
physically different, psychologically different. So depending upon the psychological nature and the biological nature, the roles are different. Some, both can do. Majority things both can do. Some things only women can do, man cannot do. Some things only man can do, women cannot do. So depending upon the background, it is distributed. Overall, they are equal. For example, if a robber enters my house, you know, I'll not tell my wife, women and men are equal, go and fight. I'll not tell my daughter, go and fight. Men and women are equal. Because Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 35, that Allah, men, the men are the protectors of the women. The men are the protectors of women because Allah has given them more strength. Where it comes to motherhood, where it comes to motherhood, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the hadith I wanted to quote to you, in Sahih Bukhari, in the book of Adab, chapter number two, hadith number two, our beloved Prophet, there was a man who asked the Prophet, who should, who deserves the maximum love and companionship in this world? The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after the two, the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after the two, the Prophet said for the third time, your mother. The man asked after the two, then the Prophet said, your father. That means 75% of the love and companionship goes to the mother. 25% goes to the father. That means mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, also the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the consolation prize. I cannot say, what is this? I want to be mother. No, you cannot be. So you have to understand men and women are equal. Now, this Western world talking about women liberalization, even they don't consider men and women equal. If men and women are equal, when they run a 100 meters race, do men and women run together? Yes or no, sister? Do they run together? When they run a 100 meters race in the Olympics, do men and women run together 100 meters? Huh? Why? If they are equal, they should run together. Why not? Because even the Western world knows men and women in physical activity are different, run differently. If you are running together, it is not correct, it's inequality. Do you understand? But when you sit for an examination in your college, do you sit together or not? Same paper? So many times it's equal. But sometimes, body degrees are different. You cannot say I will have 100 meters dash together. Football is different. Men different, women different. So what you have to realize, the, womb, the Western world also believes in it. But they are giving false talk of women's liberalization. In the garb of women's liberalization, they are degrading our sisters, our mothers. They, it is nothing, the Western talk of women liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of a body, degradation of a soul. The Western talk of women liberalization is actually, they are selling our daughters and making it in the name of, of art and culture, they are utilizing our mothers and sisters. You know, you have ad. When we see an advertisement of a motorcycle, who rides motorcycle more, girl or the man, men or the women in the world? Who rides more? Men. Invariably in a motorcycle ride, you'll find a woman. Why? Why? To attract. Men are riding, so why do you show motor women? Why? They are utilizing our mothers and daughters and they're selling them. I was told about a very famous ad, the BMW. I was told. I have not seen it. One of the person told me a very famous BMW ad, there is a girl standing in front of the ad with bikini, and the ad says, test drive her now. Who, the girl or the car? What are they doing? They're selling our daughters, they're selling our mothers, and talking about women's rights. You have to be very careful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given men and women are equal in Islam, but they are not identical. Depending upon the physiological nature, biological nature, Many a times they have the same role, many a times they have different roles. Hope that answers the question, sister. Uh, brother at the back, please. Assalamu alaikum. I am Sayyid Muzaffar.
from Applied Psychology Department. I have a question about my profession. You are already doctor and you know very well that when we have a patient who comes to abuse, who is sitting in two people, Brother, I would, I mean, brother, I do understand Hindi and Urdu. It will prefer that you ask in English. Your English is very fluent. <laughs> and most of the people understand English. So please ask the question in English. I won't have to repeat it. Okay, okay. And where are you? I cannot see you. Class, can you raise your hand? Where are you? <laughs> okay. Where are you? Yes, sir. Huh? Yes. And the blue shirt. I want to ask about my profession that some cases uh, which deals by... What's your profession? Can you repeat your name and your profession? I am Sayyid Muzaffar Hussain. Yes. From Applied Psychology Department. MashaAllah. Being a psychotherapist, we deal some cases kind of like abuse. In these cases, when we take case history and we go to treatment for those patients, for example, uh, when goes to catharsis, and in these two conditions, in uh, case history and uh, catharsis, the both are needed to loneliness. In patient and therapist should be alone. And before uh, in, your, uh, in your lecture, you are asking that one, one person in sitting with opposite sex uh, in the same room and both are alone, then third person will be saying. That's why I was asking, what is your uh, opinion about psychotherapist like in particular scenario in the catharsis and case history when the person is opposite sex? Brother, the question that in doing psychotherapy and many a time he has to be alone, alone uh, uh, with the patient. So I said that a prophet said that if two opposite sex Nam and Rama alone, the third person, what should he do? Point number one. Yeah. I will answer in general, then come to your question also. Generally, generally, as far as medical science is concerned, if you have a medical problem, it is preferable that a lady goes to a lady doctor and a gent goes to a gent doctor, generally. Not only psychotherapy, any therapy, generally. Whether it be general medicine, whether it be heart specialty, whether it be kidney, anything. If you cannot find a specialist in that field, if you cannot find a specialist in that field, you may be a lady and the heart specialist ex expert is a gent. In this case, you can meet the gent doctor, but there should be a lady also in that room. And this is ethics we are taught in the medical science. In the medical science, if I'm examining a lady doctor, I mean, a gen doctor is examining a lady patient. There has to be a female nurse, compulsory. Yeah, ethics of medicine. As far as consultation is concerned, talking about psychotherapy, yet, according to a prophet, you have to have a third person should be a lady. Because our beloved prophet said that if two namerama are alone, the third person may be a city. Coming to your question. In Western world, there are many psychotherapists and psychologists who treat opposite patients. What happens? They do haram things afterwards. Do you know that? You're a psychotherapist. When you're sitting asked together with an opposite sex, if you're sitting with a lady patient alone in the same room, staring at her and talking to her for hours together, if nothing happens to you, you require a psychiatrist. You're a psychotherapist, correct? You're sitting with the girl alone in a room for us together and talking to her. If nothing happens to you, there's something wrong with you. Do you understand? So most prob mostly in the Western world, when the psychotherapists meet each other opposite sex and sit in a closed room, they even meet outside in a closed room. And do what? They break the trust of the patient and the doctor. But in Western world, Everything allowed as long as it's with consent. In the Western world, you have sexual relationship, personal security, no problem. As long as they agree. Have sex with your doctor, as long as they agree, it's allowed. In Islam, no. If you have to have sex, you have to marry. 
if you want to stay alone. So as a professional Muslim, if you are a psychotherapist, see that you keep a nurse outside with you, not in your cabin outside. When you have a female person, patient, that nurse should sit behind. This is Islam. If you cannot do that, then you change your profession. Do you understand? This is Islam. The best psychologist, there is no better psychologist than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead of treating the patient, you will go on the wrong track. The patient may go on the wrong track. What if the patient lays the allegation that you are doing psychotherapy for two hours with her, and if she lays the allegation that you have misbehaved with you, what will you do? I'm asking a simple question. You're sitting two hours alone with a female, okay? And if she lays the allegation you misbehaved with her, what will you do? Oh, microphone, mic. I cannot justify and I cannot defend in this situation. You cannot defend, so you will be behind bars, correct? Yes. So you take protection. What is your protection? Keep a female nurse. Keep a female, yes. Female nurse? She can sit behind in the same room, so it doesn't break the hadith. When you're examining a female opposite sex patient, compulsory has to be a third person. Third person so that she's comfortable. This is the ethics of medicine. And it's the ruling of Islam. You may be a doctor, whatever it is, you have to follow the rules. If you're even a teacher speaking, giving tuition, you cannot give in a closed room. It's common. You cannot give in a public area, different. In a closed room, secluded area, third person is the devil. So whatever you do, even if you meet a specialist, you have to follow the rules. The rules and regulations have to be followed. This is Islam. That's the reason you find so many things, people doing haram activities, because they for, don't follow the rules of the Creator. Hope that answers the question, brother. Okay. Thank you. Uh, brother, in the middle, please. Next question, brother in the middle. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Abdul Azim B. Azmi. Uh, I am uh, Deputy President of Student Representatives uh, Council. Okay, um, my question is, what is your opinion uh, when a leader does not express his support for matters organized by Islamic Association? such as intellectual programs and religious programs, instead only silence when the program is being pressured by someone who have the will to stop the program. Thank you. That's my... Uh. So I do not understand the question clearly. Can you repeat it? I heard some part of it, but I do not understand completely. Okay, uh, I will uh, read Slowly and clearly. Slowly, okay. Uh, my question is, what is your opinion when a leader does not express his support for matters organized by Islamic association, such as intellectual programs and religious programs, instead only silence when the program is being pressured by someone who has the will to stop the program. Thank you. The question you understand correctly, what should a leader who doesn't support Islamic program, yes. but there's pressure from outside to stop it? Yes, this is because uh, there's, uh, in the organization there is non-Muslim. So the leader take that action to take care of the non-Muslim heart. Ah, now I understand. <laughs> that if an Islamic organization wants to do an Islamic program, the leader is silent because some non-Muslims are if the non-Muslim is objecting. So what should be done if they're objecting? Point number one, I know you're relating to me, I'm aware of it, <laughs> that many people objected to this program. Point number one, the leader should check whether the objection is correct or no. If the Islamic organization is calling a speaker which is abusing other religions, and which is criticizing other religion and causing communal disharmony, that program should not be held. But when someone lays the allegation, Quran says, Kul hatu burhanakum, produce your proof, in kuntum sadikin, but if you're truthful. Correct? I know that many, many a time when I go, in this country, the Indian non-Muslims, they object 100 times more than the Indian non-Muslim in my country. I don't know why. When anyone objects, what should the leader do? The leader should not be scared that he lose the election. The leader should be for justice. 
Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 135, Ya amanu, O oh you believe, stand out for justice and witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, even if it be against your parents, against your relatives, rich or whether they're rich or poor. He should see justice. So if someone is laying an allegation and saying, okay, Dr. Zakir Naik is causing communal disharmony. Okay, get me proof. Show me one lecture. Show me one lecture of Dr. Zakir Naik where he's causing communal disharmony. Simple. You know, I've given more than 2,000 lectures. It was said by the coordinator. If you have at least seen 1% of my, 1% of my lecture will be 20 lectures, correct? Forget 1%, 0.2%. At least four lectures. So anyone who's laying an objection, first question you ask him, how many lectures have you heard of Dr. Zakir Naik completely? First question. If they show you a clip out of context, out of context, you know Quran, Quran says do not pray. Quran says do not pray. Do you agree with me or not? No. What? No, I'm right. Who says no? Raise your hand. Quran says, don't pray. I'm right. MashaAllah. So what do you do? Not pray. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 43, do not pray when you are intoxicated. So when you read the context, it is saying, do not pray when you are having alcohol intoxicated. But if I quote half, it will give a wrong message. So anyone who says Dr. Zakir Naik is speaking against other religion, you said, give the proof. Get me one, one lecture, full lecture out of the 2,000 I've given. Full lecture, not clipping of two minutes out of context. Only one, not even two. Zakir Naik promotes terrorism. Get one lecture, one lecture only, full lecture, read. We'll hear the full lecture where he promotes terrorism. Cannot. The world was calling me on counter-terrorism. The head of the counter-terrorism department in UK in 2009 approached me saying, you can reach those Muslims who we cannot reach. Can you help us? I said, under two conditions. As long as you do not ask me to do anything Quran and Sunnah, against the Quran and Sunnah, and I don't want your money. They agreed. Next year, the government changed. Labour Party lost, Conservative came. Now they want to call me a terrorist. Ajib. Indian government calling me to give lecture in National Academy, the biggest training center in India for the police. I have given lecture there many times. New government is saying I'm a terrorist. Ajib. What happened to the world? I ask anyone who speaks against me, at least get me one proof, not two, one proof. Not out of context. It is so easy. The media here speaks against me. I ask the journalist, how many lectures have you seen of mine? Not even a single. You don't see a single lecture of mine and telling Zakir is, is spreading hatred. Is it justified? The leader should not get scared. And if actually the Muslim die, he's spreading hatred, he should not be called. But don't go out of context. You know, the Malaysian paper say Dr. Zakir Naik is banned in many countries. Do you know I'm not banned in a single country? Only once I was banned in UK. From 2010, and the letter says for three years. Officially, I was banned only in one country for three years, from 2010, June, till May 2013. That's it. There is not a single country in the world that I know of which has banned me. But yet the press says, yes. That's a different question, that half the country won't give me visa. If a country doesn't give me visa, doesn't mean I'm banned in the country. Indian press says, I'm banned in Malaysia. <laughs> Ajib. This is the job of the press, to lay allegation. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ujura, chapter 49, verse number 6, whenever you get information, check it up before you pass it on to the third person. Verify it. You don't have to believe it. Unfortunately. What nonsense the media writes? Get proof. That's the reason when Indian government, you know, there is not a single court in the world, anywhere in the world, including India, which has passed a verdict against me. I want to repeat. There is not a single court anywhere in the world, not even anywhere in India, which has passed a verdict against me. Yes, complaints, thousands. There are thousands of complaints against me. 
FIR filed against me, not a single verdict against me. Even the case which the government has filed against me for money laundering, last year in January 2018, it was a Sikh judge, Justice Manmohan. I don't know him. I have not met him. First time I heard about him. Fortunately, he had seen my videos. He is telling the investigation lawyer, have you seen the lectures of Dr. Zakirna? He says, no. He says, I have seen. Get me one lecture where he speaks for terrorism. I will ban him. I will, I will see to all his properties are confiscated. They could not. Again, last month in March, again they want to, cause me, they want to confiscate my property, money laundering. The same judge says, get me one proof, not two. So the verdicts have come for me, yet the press says, money laundering, money laundering. What they do, they pick up an article from India. If the article is negative, it will start by saying, a controversial speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik. When you read the first sentence, you understand it's a negative article. I was with one very famous Muslim news agency here, media, I won't take the name, and the owner was my fan. He took my interview. I said, bye. Why do you copy verbatim? You're copying from other people without checking. Why do you copy? At least change the starting line. Who's not controversial? Every famous person in the world is controversial. There's not a single famous person in the world who has no controversy. Can you point out one? One famous person in the world who's not controversial. Can you point out? So if they want to write a favorable article, they will say world-renowned speaker. If they want to write against a controversial speaker. The problem is anyone lays the allegation, get proof. And that's the reason when the Indian government wanted to put me on the Interpol. If any government writes to the Interpol that he's a terrorist, 99.9% .9 they'll put him on the list. In my case, they did not. Why? Today, if you tell a Muslim is a terrorist to the Interpol, 99% they will put him on the list. In my case, the Interpol rejected. The Interpol rejected India. Why? Fabricated. Indian government has asked so many countries give up Zakir. Not a single Muslim country gave me up. Why? Why? Because they know it's a fabrication. I know there are some Muslim countries that will give up. All Muslim countries are not truthful. All Muslim countries don't believe in the verse of the Quran of Surah Nisa, chapter 135. We say they stand not for justice. I really appreciate Tun Mahathir. Tun Dr. Mahathir, he's one of the few politicians who will fight for the rights of the Muslim, even if it goes against himself. I appreciate him. As far as the Muslim rights are concerned, even though having a government, which many of the MPs are non-Muslim, he is very just. What we have to appreciate, he was the first person in the world who filed in the tribunal of Kuala Lumpur, war tribunal. And he did a case against George Bush and Tony Blair, first time. And said, if this president of America and the past president of UK, if they have to step in Malaysia, we will arrest them. MashaAllah, who had the guts? Soon Dr. Mathe, that time he was in the prime minister also. Allah brought him back. I don't know about the other politics, but I know for sure that what is haq, what is truth, you have to fight. He's one of the few Muslim politicians who have the guts. All Muslim politicians don't have the guts. They will give the decision based on their benefit. Okay, if I, if I go against this Muslim, I'll get more votes, okay. Even the, even the Muslim is correct, no, put him into problems. What we have to realize, but the media, the biggest problem is the media with fake news. Fake news. I challenge any of the news, any of the news media in any country in the world, whether it be India, whether it be USA, whether UK, whether Malaysia, who writes article against me, how many lectures have they seen of mine? Even if they have seen any one lecture, can they point out that lecture and show it on the television? I will pay the money. That is against humanity. I challenge. They are doing a propaganda. So here, if someone is laying an allegation, the leader should ask for proof. Okay, Dr. Zakir next spoke again. Get the full lecture. We will see it in an auditorium. Show it. And anyone who has little knowledge of Islam, he will be able to prove 
that this lecture is not causing communal disharmony because Quran clearly states in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, that if that abuse not those people who they worship besides Allah, the gods who they worship besides Allah, lest in the ignorance they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you. Uh, can we allow a brother with the mic at, at this side, please? Hello, hello, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Shashi Barman. I'm a non-Muslim, I'm a Hindu. So, uh, I only have three questions, so. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, can you speak a bit slowly into the mic? If you have three questions, ask your best question. Okay. Whichever is most important. After we finish all the questions on the other microphone, we'll come back to you. Okay, then Slowly, I'll... clearly, loudly, microphone, very close to your mouth. Okay, cool. Okay, so my first question would be, I, I, I'd like to relate it to you. So I've seen your previous speeches before on YouTube. You are a specialist in comparative religion. So when you like uh, compare Islam and other religion like Hinduism, like quoting scriptures from Bhagavad Gita or something, like don't you think there is a possibility to misinterpret it and provide misguidance to those who doesn't belong to that faith? What's your name, brother? Pardon? Your name? Shashi Varman. Okay, and Shashi. If, if there are, it is proven that there is a misinterpretation in your speech, does that mean that you failed to carry out your duty as a Muslim professional? The brother asked a very good question, a very relevant question to the topic. I'd like to thank him. His question is that I'm a specialist of comparative religion. I prefer calling myself a student of comparative religion. And when I quote scriptures of other, other religion, like whether it be the uh, Bhagavad Gita, whether Veda, whether Bible, and if I misinterpret that scripture, then isn't it wrong as a Muslim? Totally wrong. I agree with you. That's the reason after every lecture of mine, we have question answer session. Most of the religious speaker, whether it be Hindu, whether it be Christian, whether it be Muslim, most of the majority, more than 90%, after the speech, they have no question answer session. Sheikh Didat was the first one who started, and now, mashallah, many of us. After every question, after every lecture, we have a question answer session. Why? So that if you disagree with us, you are open to ask the question. In the question answer time, if any speaker, including myself, if the questioner proves that my interpretation is wrong, I, if, I, if they prove to me first, I will say, I am sorry, I will take it back. If I make a mistake, as a Muslim, compulsory, I would apologize. I would first say, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your scripture. Inshallah, in future, I will not quote it. Never in my life of 25 years of dawah, more than one, has a single question of mashallah, I can make mistakes. I'm a human being. I'm not perfect. No human being is perfect. Not a single question ever quoted me anything and proved me wrong. Alhamdulillah. I can be wrong. I can be wrong. Therefore, we say, ask the question. If he poses a question to me, I will counter quote him and give him the quotation from his scholars. I will quote. What does Swami Vivekananda say? I will quote. So we the intellectual. That is the reason what we say, let's come for a debate. Friendly debate, no problem. But I'll only debate with someone who has some standing, not with every Tom, Dick, and Harry. You understand? You know, if I can get a million people for my talk, largest gathering, even if we get 2%, 20,000, I will debate you. Any Tom, Dick, and Harry, I cannot. So what my reason is, if you want to debate me, you should at least be able to gather minimum 20,000 for your speech. If I can get 2 million, you at least get 2%. Okay? If you can get 20,000 for your lecture, I'm willing to debate with you. If you cannot get, you give it to someone who can get. And there are many Hindu speakers in the world. There are many Christian speakers in the world who get 100,000 and more. In India, many people. You know Shishi Ravi Shankar. He gets audience of 100,000. I debated with him. And you know the outcome of that. Have you seen that debate? Yeah. What was the outcome? It was. It what? It wasn't as I, as I expected. Sorry? It wasn't as I expected, yeah. Oh, you, it wasn't as you expected. Yeah. But did I break any rules of the debate? Pardon? 
Did I break any rules of the debate? No. Did I not answer all his questions? No. Did he answer my questions? No. No. One of the most famous Hindu preacher in the world, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar. Many people call him God. Uh, but, but, sir, uh, how about Sadhguru? I guess he destroyed some of your points, I guess. Sadhguru from okay. the Okay, arrange for a dialogue, I will debate him. You arrange, I will debate him. Sadhguru is a famous person, ask him. I will debate him. There are some people who have taken his speeches and given answers. Some people, not himself. If he wants, let him arrange. No problem, I will debate him. Okay? Because I know he's famous. Any famous personality, if he wants to debate, I don't want to debate him. He wants to debate me, open, any topic. Any topic on comparative religion. Hinduism and Islam, no problem. Okay? I'm welcome. And if he points out anything in, in my speech, which I said, of context, or which is not as per the Hindu scripture, I'll apologize. I will give him from where I got. All my research are not from non-Hindu scholars, from Hindu scholars. The reference. So most of the speakers say, yes, Zakir is right, but... Then the but comes. <laughs> Many Hindus say, when you hear your speech, in two hours I've learned what I've not learned in 40 years of my life. Because in my speech, I give references. Did Shri Shri Ravi Shankar give any reference in his speech? Even one reference he gave. Did he give a single reference, brother? No. In my speech, how many references were there? So who is more authentic, a person who gives a reference, or a person who doesn't give a reference? He could have kept a chit. There's no objection. In a debate, you can have notes in front of you, right or wrong. I don't have notes. He can have notes. Ask if Shishi Ravi Shankar will have a second debate with me. Will he have? Even if you give him a million dollars, he will not have. I guess he will. But if he doesn't debate you, I'm sure one day I will. Yeah. Most welcome. The day you can get 20,000 people for your audience, I will debate you. Cool. Now what you can do, question answer. Did I answer your question or not? Yeah, you did. Thank you. Very satisfactory? Yes. I'm very happy. Thank you for accepting it. And may Allah guide you, and I'll pray for you that you come to the truth, brother. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yes, you're most welcome. Uh, please, next questions. Hi, hi sir. Uh, I, I am a, a non Muslim, and I, my name is Alita Hahao. I want to ask the daughters of a few questions. That the, the first is, how the uh, how we call the 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 Islamic will affect to the in the life and the set of how the economy, the medical and the sorry brother, I cannot understand. Can okay. you speak a bit slowly and loudly? Yeah, yeah. And your mouth close to the microphone. Okay. Slowly and clearly. Okay. Yes, brother. Uh, first, my question that I want to ask is about the the Islamic will get. Any effect for the stuff like the education, medical, and the economy in the few years that will come? Sorry, brother. I, Islamic medical economy, I do not understand. Uh, the Islamic e effect in the economy. Like the Islamic fire, effect in the economy. economy. Yes. Which economy? And the, uh, the second one is about the. Brother, the first question, effect of Islam in economy. Yes. You want to know what is the impact yes. and effect of Islam uh, in economy? First question. Yes. The second one is about the, the law of the Hudu. Second one is law of the Hudu. There are two questions. First, the impact of Islam and economy. The Islamic economic, I've given a lecture. Interest-free economy. In Islam, we believe in economy, it should benefit, but Islam is against riba, as I mentioned in my talk. According to Imam Dhabi, it is the twelfth major sin. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 278, 279, if you do not give up demands of riba, of interest, Allah will wage a war against you. So in Islamic economy, you should not deal with interest. Anything dealing with interest is prohibited. You cannot take a loan from the bank on interest. You can take loan from a bank on an Islamic Sharia concept. 
کالج مشارکہ کالج مداربہ کالج مرحبہ دے آر ویریس ایسپیکٹس بٹ انٹرسٹ اٹ از حرام تو اف یو ہیو دس اکنامی وچ از ناٹ بیسڈ آن ربا اٹ ول بی اے موسٹ اسٹرانگ اکنامی وی نو اے فیو ایئرس بیک ان ٹو تھاؤزینڈ اینڈ ایٹ دے واز اے کولیپس آف اکنامی رائٹ اور رانگ جب سٹی بینک وین ڈاؤن ایوری تھنگ وین ڈاؤن رائٹ اور رانگ بیکاز آف آف ربا because of interest so islam is against interest for more details you can refer to my video cassette interest free economy promulgated by the glorious quran as far as your second question is concerned what are my views on hudud law hudud law means if you do a crime which is a very severe crime then you require a severe punishment so based on that most of the countries they have the rules and regulation and depending upon the crime you do they put that law islamic law is the best example it is as our creator allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says if certain things are big crime if you implement the hudud the results are the best in the world that's the reason the least number of crime in any country in the world is in saudi arabia because that law is applied the moment you dilute the law even in saudi arabia you'll find crime coming so as far as the laws are concerned if you follow the law of allah and his rasul it is the best and the best result you'll get. Hope that answers the question. Uh, Thank you. I still want to ask about the hudu. If you say the hudu, uh, I still want to ask the hudu. Like we see at the, at the African country, more than half the African country is like more for the Muslim country. But they still use the hudu. By the, the number of the criminal uh, case still increase. Well, that's a very good question. He says half the Africa is Muslim. I don't know whether half, it is less than half. But why are there so many criminals and crime? The reason is because they're not following the Islamic Sharia. Show me one country in the world which is following Islamic hudud and the crime is high. They are namesake Muslims. They are namesake Muslim, but they are not following the Islamic law. One good example is Saudi Arabia. You have the Islamic hudud, the least rate of theft anywhere in the world, Saudi Arabia. The least rate of rape anywhere in the world, Saudi Arabia. Why? Why? Because they are following the law. Any country you implement the law, you will get the best result. These countries are namesake Muslim countries. They are not applying all the laws of Sharia. If you apply all the laws of Sharia, whichever law you apply, in that country you will find success. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, our brother there. Please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and very good evening. Uh, I would like to ask you, sir, uh, about uh, there are so many different countries that are applying the different law in the country. So according to the law of Islam, uh, about the criminal, we apply the hudud. However, in certain countries, we don't apply hudud. How do I practice if I am a judge or a lawyer, how do I practice a duty of a Muslim as a professional in... What's the name, brother? Farhad. Farhad? Yes. Uh, so, how do you practice? So how do I practice a duty of a Muslim if I state the judgment uh, not based on the Al-Quran and Sunnah, but I based on the law of the country? Ah, if you are practicing as a Muslim professional lawyer, and if the law of the country is going against the law of Islam, you don't practice that law profession simple yes uh, if so the law of the country is going against the law of the sharia you don't practice it it is haram to practice yes it may be very close to it no problem if it is contradicting with the law of the sharia you cannot practice it okay simple so i give you example like uh, whether you asked a question i give the answer now you want to give yes. example after i give the answer yeah uh, can no. we have the next question no, no, it's not a question. It's my, my not yours. There are many people waiting on okay, different okay. microphones. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, most welcome. Can we have the next question, please? The next question is from in the middle. Hello. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good Waalaikum morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning to Dr. Zakir Naik. Um, I straight to the point. Uh, my name is Muhammad Farid Muhammad Azmi. Uh, I'm from BBA student, second, second year of BBA student. The question is, the era that we're living in now has developed into a world that has no boundaries. We have no limited access. Brother, brother, slowly, okay. 
clearly. Okay. <laughs> The because question? the problem is the microphone, it's not very clear. All right. You can hear your voice, but here the microphones are not very clear. I mean, the speakers are not clear. So therefore, if you speak slowly, it will be more sure. understandable. Yes, brother. Thank you. Jazakallah. The era that we're living in now has developed into a world that has no boundaries. We have no limited access to all information worldwide. However, with all these technologies, the Islamic country is still unable to help those in need and to stop the operation of Muslims in Palestine, Gaza, Syria, and etc. So, I want you to share your thoughts on this matter. The brother has asked a very important question, that today the world has become into a global village, and we can get information you know, at the tip of your fingers, WhatsApp, YouTube, Facebook, various things. And today we find that many Muslim countries are under operation, whether it be Palestine, whether it be different countries, Syria, Yemen. So what should we do? Brother, go back to Quran and Sunnah. The problem is that we Muslims, as I told my lecture today, have a lot of money, wealth. Instead of spending in the right way in the cause of Allah, they are giving it to the enemies because they are afraid. They think that the enemies of Islam can save them. If they spend it in the right way in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we Muslims are united, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, Wa tasimu bihablillahi jamia wa la Hold strongly together to the rope of Allah and be not divided. If we Muslims are united, we are about 2 billion Muslims. More than 25% of the world population today are Muslim. 25%. We are the religion which is the maximum practiced. In numbers, the Christian may be more. In practice, Muslims are the more. If we are united on the basis of Quran and Sunnah, we will be the biggest force. No one will be, a, no one will be able to persecute us. The problem is, if one country, Muslim country is in problem, the other Muslim country say, why should I interfere? Our beloved Prophet said, if one Muslim has a problem, like how one body has a problem, the other body also feels the pain. So we should be united. As I told, there are very few Muslim leaders in the world today who voice out their opinion for the Islamic cause. You have one Erdogan, that's in Turkey. May Allah reward him. You have one Sun Dr. Mahathir here in Malaysia. <laughs> Hardly you can count on your fingertips. There are so many Muslim countries. But where? They don't want to open their mouth. They're afraid. Why are they afraid that if I interfere, maybe they will subjugate us. Maybe they'll have economic blockade. They don't have faith in Allah. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 135, Ya illadhin amunu, O you believe, stand out for justice that witness to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives, against the rich or poor. The problem is that we are afraid more of the enemies of Allah than Allah itself. If we go back to Quran and Sunnah, if we are only afraid of Allah and no one else, we'll again be the strongest force in the world. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What they say? That we pray that may Allah ease the difficulty. Every individual, whatever you can do, at least you do. Whether you can do dua minimum, do dua. You can support economically, support economically. Whatever you can do. If Allah has given you the power to speak, then you speak. Just a couple of weeks back, there was a conference in Putrajaya for Masjid Aqsa, in support of Masjid Aqsa. And mashallah, speakers came from all over the world. They invited me also to speak, and I gave a speech. The problem is that we Muslims today are afraid. Allah has given us the wealth, but the Prophet said, I'm more fearful, I'm not fearful, afraid of my ummah about poverty. I'm more afraid that when they become wealthy, they will go away from the deen. This is a problem. So if you go back to the Quran and Sunnah, Quran and say Hadith, and if you're united, we'll be the strongest force in the world, and no one will be able to subjugate us. Hope that answers the question. Brother. Thank you. Uh, brother, please. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Waziri. I'm from Nigeria. I'm a PhD student here. So he's a golden opportunity having an interactive session with you. My question is... Uh, louder, please, brother. During the Rabiul Awal, where millions of 
Muslims all over the world. We are celebrating the birth of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I come across one of your writers on Facebook that those that are performing Maulud is Bidya. So I just want to, you to enlighten me more. Why do you think those that celebrated the birth of our noble prophet, even right point, now here? Point number one, this question is not on the topic, but it will answer you. This question is out of the topic. Okay. It will answer you because it's talking about me. Okay, so point number one, the Facebook you're talking about, which gave an article a few months back, that is a fake Facebook on me. The, my Facebook has got 17.4 million likes, followers. How many? How many, brother? Brother, can you hear me? Can you come to the microphone? Yeah, yeah, I heard you, yeah. Did that Facebook we spoke about me had 17.4 million likes and followers? No. There are more than 100 fake accounts on my name on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, if you know a little bit about social media, any Facebook which has original will have a tick. And that Facebook was picked up by the Malaysian media. Oh, Dr. Zakir Naik says, agrees with the fatwa of the Saudi Mufti. That Facebook may not be his in the ending they're saying. They are picking up a fake Facebook. That today what you have in the social media, there are thousands of posts made by others on me. Thousands. Many are made by my fans, many are made by my enemies. One third of them are actual things what I said in my lecture. They make it and they upload it, no problem. Some things my fans make which I did not say, but it's correct as per the Quran and Sunnah, again I have no problem. One third are enemies of Islam who want to malign me. Once. One poster, Dr. Zakir Naik says, having sex with the sheep is good. No, where they get this from? They take my photograph from the Facebook, correct? So first, as a Muslim, what you should do? Quran says in Surah Hujura, chapter 49, verse number six. When you get the information, check it up before us conveying whether did you check up whether the Facebook was authentic or not. Tell me frankly, you are a Muslim, correct? Yeah. Did you check? Yeah. Did you see that article yourself on the Facebook? Yes or no? No. No. You read an article in the newspaper and you believe the kuffar, correct? <laughs> this is the problem. If a kafir is saying Dr. Zakir Naik is wrong, you are believing more in the kafir. What you should have done? Gone on my Facebook, it is there. This is the problem. We Muslims don't follow Quran. What does the Quran say? Check it up before asking any question. Did you check up? How long does it take to just type? Facebook, Zakir Naik. 10 seconds, correct? But no time, okay. busy. <laughs> Who's to blame? <laughs> this is how the kafirs are dividing the Muslims. This is how the non-Muslim media, they know the weak point of the Muslim is there are Muslim sects with different views. So they purposely let these different views come and divide us, correct? What the Quran says? Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 103. Wa tasimu bi hablillahi jamia wa la tafarku. Hold together to the rope of Allah strong. Even if we differ, why should we fight? Even if you and I differ on certain things, does it make us to fight? What are you doing? You're helping the enemies of Islam. Correct? You could have gone in your room and checked it. Five minutes. You want to ask the question in front of the public, okay and be an agent of the enemies of Islam. Brother, will you get sawab for this? Brother, will you get sawab for this? Uh, <laughs> yes or no? No. <laughs> I forgive you. Thank you, sir. Because I love you, brother. Thank you so much. I love I, you I said this, why, brother? Not to be angry against you, to show you an example. And I thank you for bringing this question, though it's out of the topic. People should not say, oh, Zakir is running away. So if it's a personal question, answer. Because I'm a da'i of Allah. I'm on the haq. Why should I be afraid? There may be difference. You may say, keep your hand on the chest, someone sit down. So what difference does it make? Yes, you follow what is right, but we should not fight over it. Correct? Yeah. If someone keeps the hand on the chest, someone keeps down. Difference of opinion. I do my research, I follow, I may differ. 
but that doesn't make us Muslim. You know, I've given a lecture, I'd given in Terango, I'd given a lecture in Terangano in 2016, unity in the Muslim Ummah. If we differ on small issues, we believe in the same Quran, we believe in the same prophet. If we differ on small issue, we should agree to disagree. We should agree, and disagree. agree to disagree, but on the 95%, we are same. So why are you helping the kuffar, the enemies of Islam, to make the Muslims fight? This is the job of the media. And the media, especially the non-Malay media, which I read, majority of the information is wrong. Majority. What they write about me is wrong. No one is taking action. No one. No one. Shame. No one is going and telling the media, where do we get this proof? They're picking up some information and the media, and they're laying allegation, laying allegation, laying allegation, and they're making Muslims fight. They know there are differences. This is what we Muslims, we all the Muslims should be united. We may differ, no problem. We agree to disagree. Don't let the enemies of Islam get better of us. I'm not trying to get any communal disharmony. I'm trying to get the Muslims united. And you know the best rights that any Muslim has, that any non-Muslim has, is under Muslim rule. You see the history. See the history of the world. The amount of crusaders, the amount of torture they did in the name of religion. Even the Christianity sect was tired. And the amount of non-Muslim, they enjoyed security in the rule of the Muslim land. I'm talking about the great Muslim rulers. The Muslim in Muslim rule, the maximum protection any non-Muslim can get anywhere in the world is in the true Islamic rule, not the fake one. No, today most of the Muslim countries are namesake Muslim countries. But those who follow Quran and Sunnah, the best you will find is in the, in, is in the law of Allah and His Rasul. We cannot do injustice even to a non-Muslim. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there are still uh, some more questions uh, to be asked, but unfortunately, we just uh, get the notification that the last bus provided uh, will only be uh, and will be ready uh, within a couple of minutes. So I will only allow uh, one last question from our sister, please. Hello, hello, hello. Can I ask a question over here, um, left left side? <laughs> hello. <laughs> oh, there. Okay, please. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay uh, hello, my name is Libyana Andy. Uh, I'm taking risk management and insurance. So my question is, uh, before that, in my religious education, the birth of Jesus is there and the death of the God of Jesus is there. In Bible, there is no death that says the birth and death of Jesus. So my question is, is it in Islam believe Jesus in the Bible has his death of birth and if I'm not mistaken, it is in January month. So, I just want to explain from you, doctor, why in my religion is not mentioned in the Bible of the birth, death of Jesus, and what evidence in the Bible is the Jesus death of birth in January. Thank you. Please, sir. <clears throat> Sister, question wasn't really clear. I understood about that the Bible speaks about the birth and death of Jesus Christ, about the Quran. Can you, sister, speak a bit more slowly and clearly? It's not your fault, it's the fault of the sound system. So I wouldn't blame you. Can you repeat the question slowly and clearly so that I can give a better answer? Part I understood, but not completely. Okay. Um, straight forward uh, to my question. Is it in Islam believe Jesus in the Bible has his death of birth, and if I'm not mistaken, is it in January month? Is it in Jeremiah? Ah, uh, um, yeah, just Jeremiah. what I heard from someone. So that the birth and death of Jesus is in the Quran. Uh, no, in Bible. 
Okay. The question I understand that the Bible speaks about the death and birth of Jesus. So what do the Muslims think about Jesus, peace be upon him, about the death and the birth? As far as the birth, I will compare both the birth in the Quran and the Bible, and I'll compare the death in the Quran and the Bible. Uh, yes. Yes? Uh, uh, I just want Dr. explain uh, why my religion is not mentioned in the Bible of the birth death of Jesus, but um, for Muslim, they believe that uh, in the Bible, there is the death of the birth of Jesus. <laughs> death of the birth of the Jesus. Uh, uh, oh, date. Ah, uh, date. The, oh, date of the birth of Jesus. Yeah. Ah, now I understand. The sorry. Death, the birth I was saying and death, the death. death of the birth of Jesus. So, <laughs> date. Okay, sorry. It's my fault. It's not your fault. Date. And the sound system. <laughs> now I understand the question. And correct me if I'm wrong. The sister is asking, why do the Muslims don't believe in the date of the birth of Jesus Christ? Peace be upon you. Correct? I am a student of comparative religion. I don't know anywhere in the Bible which gives the date of the birth of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Uh, Will I continue? Yes, continue. The date, you give me the reference, I'll accept it. I've read the Bible, nowhere in the Bible, what does the Bible say when Mother Mary, may Allah be pleased with her, when she shook the tree, the date fell, no dates are not there when it is winter. So from this incident you come to know that surely Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, wasn't born in the winter. What we come to know when we study Christianity, it was in the Council of Nice in 325 CE. They used 25th December as the birth of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, because actually 25th of December in paganism, they believe it is the birthday of the sun god. And in the paganism, they wanted to match something with the people knew so that more people are attracted towards Christianity. So it was by a few Christians who suggested there is no evidence whatsoever in the Quran or any Christian scripture about the date of the birth of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. This is taken from paganism and they adopted it and they gave it 25th of December. There is no proof at all. If there is proof, you give it to me and I'll accept it. Hope that answers the question, sister. Okay, thank you. Most welcome. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, with that last question, then we come to the end, uh, to the end of uh, this session. So, Jazakallah Khar al Jaza. Thank you very much to Dr. Zakir Knight with all the knowledge that he shared. And I believe that we have obtained a lot uh, from him today. Thanks again, and a big round of applause to Dr. Zakir Knight. Uh, with that, I uh, uh, apologies for any shortcomings while I'm handling this session. And until we meet again in any further, uh, any future opportunity, then I will pass this mic uh, to the MC. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you to our speaker and moderator. Moving on, we would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Hendrik Ben Lamsali, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Students Affairs and Alumni, accompanied by the Program Director, Mr. Mohammad Imran, to be on the stage to present token of appreciation to Dr. Zakir Nai.
Next, I would like to invite Dr. Aminur Rashid bin Yatiban, our program moderator. Thank you to Associate Professor Dr. Hendrik Melamsali, Mr. Mohamed Imran, and to our speaker and moderator. Announcing the departure of Associate Professor Dr. Hendri Lamsani, Dr. Zakir Nai, and other honorable guests. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain calm.